on European Union citizens and instructed our committee, the Libre Committee, and I'm quoting, to conduct an in-depth inquiry into the matter in collaboration with national parliaments and the EU US experts and to report back by the end of the year. So we are here to cooperate with the other relevant committees which might be of interest, namely AFET Inter, as well as the delegation of the European Parliament to the relations, bilateral relations with the United States. And then open to colleagues and fellow committees of national parliaments which are also which are, which are also dealing from their side with the issue involved this is a discussion which is to be open to european union citizens the main issue at stake is about the right coffee please caffeine balls caffeine balls the rights of European Union citizens in times of mass electronic surveillance, as endorsed by the Libre Committee, our colleague Claude Moraes has been the signed rapporteur. This appointment has been endorsed just this morning, and we have less than four months to go all the way to conduct the inquiry. As we are coming close to the end of the mandate of the term, time is of the essence. So the report could be put to vote in the Libre Committee by December and we voted in the plenary by January. I, I am announcing that a camera crew, camera crew from Germany, in the film is the name, has been allowed to be present in our meeting in the context of the filming of David Burnett's documentary on European Union legislative process about data protection, which is to be accomplished also by the end of the term, by the end of this mandate. They have been following our works since January 2012 and uh, following step by step the way forward towards a new regulation on data protection, our so-called data protection package, which has been dealt with by this very Libe Committee. They have already been filming many of our sessions and uh, they continue to, to do alike along the way ahead. Now let's move on to the session. The point here is to attend the witnessing of press entities and investigating journalists that have played a key role, a key role, unveiling surveillance program we are to investigate. This is why we open this working session of inquiry, listening to some of them, the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs is uh, in charge of fundamental rights of the European Union citizens, right to privacy, freedom of expression, right to an effective remedy, our core values and fundamental rights as confirmed by the European Convention of Human Rights on the Charter of human rights, which is a component element of the Lisbon Treaty. That is why we are welcoming our guests this afternoon, namely, first, Monsieur Jacques Folleroux. Please be welcome, journalist from the prestigious Le Monde, published information on a French system for gathering all forms of electronic data. We're also welcoming Mr. Jacob Appelbaum, investigative, in, investigative journalist, software developer, and computer security researcher with the top project, TOR project. And we're going to be having, in third place, we're going to be having through video conference, as he has not been able to attend this session physically, Mr. Alan Rusbridger. Ruth Bridger, who is the editor-in-chief of the Garden News and Media. He will be attending a video conference with all of us by 6, no, excuse me, by 4.30, by 4.30. We had planned this video conference also with Glenn Greenwald, well-known 
for his security and liberty block in the garden. So we have accepted, he, he had a, uh, accepted to participate from Brazil. Unfortunately, in the end, this, this video conference with Mr. Glenn Greenwald cannot take place. So we're concentrating on, we're, we're concentrating on Mr. Alan Roosbridger this afternoon. Now, we, we will be updating on the schedule at a later stage. Let's hear from the witnessing of our two guests, which are physically here. Monsieur Follerou in the first place, and then Mr. Applebaum. Follerou, you've got the floor. No, no. I mean, what is it? Is it a point of order? Is it a point of order? Really? Is it... it uh, yes, sorry. I think many of us would be interested in why the video conference with Glenn Greenwald was uh, cancelled. It would be interesting to know the reason. Thank you. Question of timing. The person happens to be in Brazil at the present time, so it was impossible to arrange it in timing. But we will keep putting interest into it so that we may arrange it for the further session. We're, we're going to be rushing with the timing, as, as I said. The schedule is of the essence so that we can accomplish our work before the end of the year. So we're going to try again later on at a later stage. But for this afternoon, we're having three. We're having three relevant journalists, which is going to be interesting enough. Let's get started by Mr. Folleroux. Merci de... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Just uh, a few words on behalf of the director of the Le Monde newspaper. Who believes it is the responsibility of journalists today to explain the work that they're doing on this subject. In France, this is still considered to be a rather minor subject, this uh, affront to individual and public freedoms. And I'm really here today, just as a journalist, to talk to you about the work that we were doing, what we were working on, and the series of articles that we wrote uh, at the beginning of July, which meant that we were able to relieve, uh, reveal sorry, the existence of a, a massive storage and interception system for personal data in France, and uh, this was not subject to any real administrative or political scrutiny. So this was an investigation that we carried out following the revelations made regarding the PRISM system. And in France, unlike in the United States or in the United Kingdom, all of the technological means that are available for intercepting electronic signals are not separately stored like they are, for example, in GHCQ or in, at the NSA, but these technological means, these resources are actually in the hands of the DGSE, which is the uh, French intelligence service, basically, uh, which is supposed to be working outside French borders. And they hold these technologies then. And since 2005 or 2006, or even 2007, over these three years, these, uh, this intelligence service was uh, granted a huge amount of technological resources. Uh, these were financed by the parliament in the framework of uh, an update which is what it was called, an update of the means that France has to intercept electronic signals um, when it comes to improving the sovereignty of uh, intelligence gathering that is done in France. I'll come back later on to the reasons why um, France created problems when it equipped itself with these technologies. Because for us, it's not really a question as to whether it's a good idea or not for a country to be combating terrorism. For us, really, the big issue is scrutiny. Because this database, which 
unlike what we're told officially, is actually storing billions of data for a number of years, is not just a database which is exclusively used by the intelligence services, which again operates outside France, but it, in France there is a system which is able to tap into this huge database which is currently run by the largest computer server in France. Uh, so that means that other intelligence services in France are able, by law, to intervene and tap into uh, this database, and they are operating on French territory. And this is a daily check. These are daily checks, checks then, that are being carried out by these services um, that nobody knew about before. Because this means that today the counter espionage service or indeed the customs authorities or the track fin authorities which are involved in investigating financial crimes can get in touch with the intelligence services the dgse and get information on any individual these could be people who have been involved with terrorist actions or terrorists themselves that's possible but we're basically working on the principle that the, uh, the person requesting the information is acting within the law. But there is no other validation of the research done or the compiling of this data or the way in which it's stored. So you have a kind of parallel system here which is totally without proper scrutiny. And it really... Uh, is very much in the same vein of the revelations made by the pri by John Snowden regard Edward Snowden rather regarding the prism system basically an intelligence service has the means now to carry out massive interception and storage of personal data and there is no real scrutiny it's just up to the uh, executive to intercept that data and then store the data now, of course, in France, there is legislation in place which originally focused on telephone interceptions, and there are even proper bodies which have to be consulted by the police, for example, or other services when they want to start uh, tapping people's telephone calls and so on. This is known as the CNCES in France, this body, but when it comes to metadata, and that's the data that are stored by the GSE, then actually the CNCIS doesn't have either the personnel or the administrative capacity or even the right um, to be in working in consultation uh, on that or to know what's happening to these metadata. Now, this all happened in July then. These revelations came out in July. And... Paradoxically, there wasn't really much of a reaction. And that's why it's really important and meaningful for us to be able to speak here to you today. Because basically, in a country like France, where there is a very strong centralized state, we've got the Fifth Republic now, but generally people seem to think that it's not that strange for a state to have these technological means and to carry out uh, these activities. People think it's normal. Now, we think that that is uh, a bit poor in terms of counter-establishment power or anti-establishment power. And uh, the discussions so far have really been technical discussions regarding the actual technological means that the GGSE have to actually intercept uh, signals People have been focusing on that instead of looking at the law or looking at the extent of scrutiny held by the parliament, for example, or indeed uh, more basic things like uh, citizens' freedoms and the rights that they should ha hold when it comes to protecting their private data or the data of companies or the state, for example. And that is really why that we as journalists, non-political actors, uh, want to react. And here we are now talking to you at the European Parliament. You have set up this committee of inquiry to look into this. And if the Parliament takes this 
so seriously then it's perhaps because well that the, 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 the sad thing is here that it's not necessarily the Parliament that is going to be able to take action to try to roll back uh, these infringements on people's rights and privacy. Because if you look at the reaction to these revelations or the reactions to uh, the PRISM revelations by the NSA when it comes to telephone surveillance or interceptions of uh, communications between governments or French ministers and so on, then you can see that uh, each country reacts in its own way. But obviously in America, uh, there's a lot more money behind uh, the different reactions. But in Europe, it has been rather meagre. But if France were sort of to step up to the plate and uh, start perhaps throwing... Uh, you know, more s serious arguments against America, then you might have wa Washington responding in a more robust way. So this is what really what we were interested in, how this is all panning out, and obviously this is a work in progress. We were looking particularly at the French uh, compiling of data and the storage of these data and also looking at the possibility of agreements that exist between different services for intelligence in France and the agreements that exist between them and the telephone operators like SFR, Bouygues, Orange. We don't know if these agreements exist as there were agreements found to be in existence between the NSA and other uh, major operators agreements then regarding the capacity to intercept uh, all traffic. So there are lots of question marks still that we need to have answers for. There was a parliamentary delegation for uh, information which is responsible for trying to exercise scrutiny over the French intelligence services. This is a fairly new uh, body. They've only been in place, this group, since 2007, and they have restricted means available to them. For example, they're only allowed to speak to the directors of the French intelligence services. And uh, their communication powers are really very limited. And the members of the delegation uh, are important people. The chairman of the Defence Committee, for example, the chairman of the uh, Justice Committee. So they're very busy people anyway, so they haven't got much time to dedicate to this particular scrutiny committee or delegation. Uh, just a few more words before we get to the Q&A, which will be more interesting. As a journalist, what I'm really struck by here is the uh, way in which the different political stakeholders in France have reacted the French members of parliament are basically accepting, really, the idea that the government should have these powers. They are somehow giving their sort of approval or acceptance to this infringement of their powers, this encroachment. And as journalists, that's really what's shocked us. We see this reaction again and again. Lots of people just say, you know, it's not that serious, it's not that important. But when we speak to government representatives, people who, for example, work closely with the French president or the French prime minister, or even people who are high-ranking uh, officials in the intelligence services, these people who perhaps accept the debate per se, uh, you know, they will say again and again, you're worrying about nothing. Because at the end of the day, people who are responsible for massive interception of data. At the end of the day, these people are defenders of our republic. And uh, maybe it's true. People working for the intelligence services, you know, most of them really are interested in democracy. But, and the point is that People who are responsible for these different competences are true Republicans, they're French Republicans, they will not 
uh, betray their country and these amazing uh, technologies you know are safe within the hands of these people that's what we're told again and again but these are questions of principle really that's why the law is so important because if we were just to sort of uh, say okay you know this is all okay and if we assume that these technologies are not used for anything other than terrorism and combating terrorism and other threats and so on. But the point is, these technologies could all at any moment be used for other purposes, uh, encroaching on people's private lives and so on. We don't know what they're going to be used for. And we saw as well that under uh, Sarkozy, it, you know, there were incidences where the law could be bypassed to protect people's individuals in, uh, individual interests. And the problem is then that people are acting outside the law. And as journalists, we also have an interest in the idea of citizenship and uh, calling the establishment to account. It doesn't mean we're sort of being militant about it, but we just have a, a, a role to play. We don't want to sort of try and play a kind of messiah role or anything like that, but we've got to keep people on their toes and be vigilant. That's our role. That's how we see our role. So we hope that the work being done here in Brussels at the European Parliament will uh, alert people to what's going on. Um, I'm a little bit pessimistic as to what will happen in, French, in France, though. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Follerou, and thank you for being brief and uh, precise. Mr. Applebaum. Mr. Applebaum, you've got the floor. Thanks so much for, for having me. It's, uh, it's quite an honor to be here. This is my first time in uh, European Parliament. Um, so I... I sort of wanted to take a broad view of someone who um, has some experience with this. I've spent the last decade working in a kind of censorship resistance field. I work on the Tor network. It's an anonymity network that people can use so as to not be surveilled and to bypass censorship. Um, it's actually funded by the U.S. State Department, the Swedish International Development Agency, and um, it's a free software project. However, I'm here more in my capacity as an independent journalist, as an investigative journalist, but also as a person who has been subject to extreme scrutiny under these types of surveillance programs. Um, so with that said, um, I definitely want to talk about the NSA, and I will, but I want to have a, a, a broader view, because part of what we've learned from Snowden and his whistleblowing in the public interest is that the NSA has an all-encompassing spy program, essentially. But what is not really well described in public yet is how it is actually the case that the FBI and the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States also have similar access programs. So, for example, when people talk about these um, PRISM-like programs or PRISM itself, what, the, what that name actually means is it's a program where people in corporations or perhaps uh, nonprofits of any kind or simply uh, organizations are, are complicit in helping the government, either because they are forced under the FISA Amendments Act, um, FAA 702, I believe, is the specific FISA Amendments Act that they are using in the United States. And in this case, Google, for example, or Yahoo, or Skype, or Microsoft, they have either <coughs> systems inside of their networks or attached to their networks where they are willingly and knowingly assisting in secret interception, and that would be the PRISM program, or there are significantly more serious business record-like legal instruments, which don't really even have a name other than business records. Um, so, for example, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States has a thing called a National Security Letter, of which I believe I am actually a subject, uh, which is a, a kind of interesting story for another time. But um, these are generally considered to be unconstitutional in the United States, and judges have ruled that. And it appears that each branch and each agency has something that is like a National Security Letter. And in the case of the business records, it, it, it seems, in fact, significantly worse than a national security letter. So it's not just a matter of metadata. It's, in fact, whatever business records. So that's 
any record a business may create or that you may create with a business. So if we consider PRISM and then we consider the fact that they have hardware that's inside of these networks or on site of these computer systems, it really is everything unless there is specific pushback inside of companies. And this we could call PRISM. But it's actually more than just one program. PRISM is just one program, and there are many programs that are like this. And there's another, there's another word which has been used quite a lot for companies that maybe don't fit exactly to that mold, and it's been called upstream. But upstream is more of a description. That is, it's rather how it is that they're doing it technologically. Um, it sort of suggests that there's a little bit less complicity with the people that are targeted, but what it suggests is that if they can't monitor someone directly or can't reach inside of an organization, they monitor any communication with that organization. So that is, they are upstream of that company, of those entities, of those systems. So the Tempora system, which is the full take collection system running in the United Kingdom by GCHQ, this is a system in the sense that they are the entire internet leaving and entering the United Kingdom. And any packet, any piece of data that flows through the United Kingdom goes into Tempora and it is stored for, as of the last time I've heard, at least three full days. So that's every single thing. It's not just metadata, all data. Right? So that kind of system combined with something like PRISM is a surveillance apparatus that the world has never seen before. When Duncan Campbell revealed Echelon to the world, it was pretty terrifying. It was a very impactful thing for me. But when he revealed it uh, to the world, I didn't imagine it could actually become so much worse. But Echelon, by comparison, um, is the kid stuff that hackers create these days. And the systems that we are seeing Snowden having revealed through Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, um, these systems are so advanced. Um, the way that these systems work and the way that these programs work is, is really, it's, it's a three-phase approach. The first is through complicity, either with so-called legal instruments. The second is by just normal surveillance and spying, which is the upstream. And then the third is what has recently been talked about as the Genie program. This was recently revealed uh, in the Washington Post. But Genie is just one of many programs for tactical exploitation. So that is to say that they want to know what it is that you're doing. And so they can't monitor you upstream. They can't go to Google to get your information. So they break into your computer system. And according to what the Washington Post has recently revealed, there are th tens of thousands of systems which have been compromised by the NSA in an active way under just the Genie program. There are other programs like that that I'm familiar with, which have not yet been revealed in public, which will be revealed in good time, where they are targeting specific pieces of software, where they are targeting specific types of people, and where they are specifically doing it for people that are not terrorists. And in fact, in some of the things that are clearly uh, noted in some of these documents, it is the case that the terrorist is the exception. So if they have 30 cases, one of them might be a terrorist. This is something that's very concerning because with a full take collection, it is necessarily the case that you have every single person surveilled and naturally one or two of them may be terrorists accused, suspected, not even convicted, certainly not indicted. Um, so this is something which is also very important to keep in mind. These people have not actually been formally charged in any way, and yet they are painted in this way. So in fact, for the most part, people that are targeted in this way and that are under this surveillance, none of them are really terrorists in this case. There are some special exceptions, but it's important to recognize how these things tie together because it's very boring just to talk about technology. And in fact, since almost no one understands the technology, it's a waste of time. Instead, what we can talk about is the things that people really do understand, which is that with the Five Eyes program, and that is to say the Defense Signals Directorate of Australia, um, CSE from Canada, the GCSB from New Zealand, GCHQ from the United Kingdom, and the NSA from the United States, they have formed a partnership such that Despite the American Revolution against the British, GCHQ can query the NSA's databases of American citizens, where they have similar full take collection systems. How that's legal is completely beyond me. How that, for example, is democratic, how it represents upholding my country, uh, it, it to me is, is a quite a dumbfounding thing because, in fact, I'm sure the British feel the same when the NSA queries their 
their system. And I would be quite upset about that as well. But looking at this, those are what are called first-tier partners. So those are the partners, GCHQ and NSA are first-tier partners, and the others are, are second-tier partners. BND, that's the Bundesnachrichtendienst of Germany, um, they are a third-tier partner. My understanding is that it's not unlike BitTorrent uh, piracy sharing sites in that you have a quota to fill. And so if you're a third-tier third partner, you have to contribute some information to be able to query some information out. I'm not totally clear on how this works, but it is an interesting distinction between the different tiers. And this ultimately comes together to be used in, uh, in, in really egregious ways. So for example, there exists signals emission databases and fingerprint or signature databases where you have a particular uh, signature for your voice, you have a particular set of selector or selector-like objects, that is your email address, your phone number, things like that. Anytime you pick up a new device and you enter these selector-like objects into this new device, that new device becomes linked to you if it passes by one of these sensors. What that means is that there exists a sort of emergent pattern-based identity system for the entire planet and every person that is on the planet. And then this data is fed into geographic tracking systems. The NSA and the CIA have a system whereby they track people, and the slogan is, we track them, you whack them. This is published, I believe, in the Washington Post most recently. So it is the case that the surveillance data is tied directly into flying robots that kill people without process. Right? So the surveillance has a huge impact on people in a very literal sense, like with rockets. So in, in, in this case, this is almost all passive. The first two parts of what I mentioned are passive. The tactical exploitation is not, is not passive. But I want to dispel the myth of the passive NSA, which is that they're just some guys, some really cute mathematicians with pocket protectors, and they're just like doing math and breaking codes, and they're like heroes in these World War movies. It's really, I mean, there are people that are like that in the NSA, and there are some really incredible, um, there are some really incredible people that do work there that are good people, and many of them actually have left to blow the whistle, like Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and Edward Snowden. In, in actuality, though, these people are doing active operations. So, for example, I've become familiar with a program which has not yet been revealed in public where they uh, instruct agents of the NSA to be able to go uh, to uh, an urban area to penetrate people's house networks, like their home wireless network. This type of a program is like the modern black bag job of, uh, you know, a digital era. To go and break into your house is, a, is the kind of stuff you would see in a Cold War movie, and they have training slides, in fact, for doing exactly that electronically when they can't get in another way. These, these kinds of systems and these kinds of uh, programs are extremely terrifying because they're not democratic by their very nature. They're secret. They're without oversight. Whatever oversight might exist is mostly meaningless because those people who are doing the oversight have so much trust and so little education. And this is the key thing. Most of the people in the U.S. Congress that I have become familiar with in any way, um, they, they have other people print their email for them. They don't really understand how the electronic world works. None of them can tell you what TCP IP is. Very few of them understand what, what wiretapping is in, in actuality. And what we're, what we're actually seeing here is that the architecture itself of these systems is left vulnerable on purpose. So there exists encrypted fax machines, for example. We know that the, the, the European... Um, uh, the European Parliament was intercepted. I believe it was the European Parliament that was intercepted for, uh, I think it was a crypto AG encrypted fax machine. And it looks like they did what we would call a tempest attack, which is that they looked for electronic emissions from the encrypted device. And then from that, they were able to recover this the actual pre-encrypted fax data, which is to say that they were not, they didn't break the encryption, they went around the encryption. Um, so what we see is that there are some architectural changes that change the type of attack that is possible, which means it changes the economic scale and it changes, in fact, the ability to carry out the attack in some cases. So in this case, when we have so-called lawful interception programs, what we need to recognize is that the NSA is not bound by European laws and they do not care what your laws say. So when you say it will be proportionate and balanced to be able to wiretap people for the purposes of terrorism, you are also tacitly endorsing the NSA to wiretap everyone in your country 
without any judicial process, without any proportionality whatsoever. This is what happened in Greece with the Athens affair, almost certainly. We don't know that it was the NSA, but it was an actor with sufficient capabilities. And they were able to wiretap the prime minister as well as members of parliament. And it also moved the risk from uh, a world where it was military to a world where uh, you have someone that operates a computer and they're the last line of defense between your prime minister being wiretapped and not. And in the case of uh, the Vodafone incident in Greece, the person in charge of that telephone switch was found hanged to death in his apartment. And the reason is because he's not trained. He wasn't trained to do these things or to defend an entire nation in that way. So it changes the balance of power in a very serious, uh, serious fashion. So um, with that said, there exists a series of sensors around the entire planet. And these sensors actually... Um, I mean, you can think of the entire planet if you could visualize, I'm a very visual person, so visualize a globe of the world, and now imagine there are electronic emissions from this globe. The NSA's job is to capture all of it, including what goes into space, and they do. So where there are interesting communication satellites, there exist communication satellites behind those satellites. What do you suppose that those satellites do? Interesting things to look into. But if we look at the internet and we look at telephone systems, when the NSA is unable to actually get access to a system through some kind of complicity or through, through some kind of data sharing program, they repurpose things that are already there. So when we look at programs like X Keyscore, for example, we see that they have coverage in places where we know that the state would, whichever state that might be, would absolutely not give this data willingly. How is it that they have that? And the answer is that they implant or they put a rootkit into these systems and they extract this data. And when they do searches, they're able to actually do real-time searches with those selector and selector-like objects to pull things out of that entire, that whole globe of electronic signals to feed it back to one of the massive data repositories. So for example, in the Bluffdale, uh, Bluffdale Utah facility, this is meant to store more than 100 years of data. So if we think about these systems as a whole, we actually have a planetary surveillance system that is not accountable to the people that is used for extrajudicial assassination in addition to other things. And one of the only hopes we have is to use encryption to change the way and to change the economic value of such interception. We can't stop people from spying, but we can lower the value of that spying. So I look forward to talking more about this, and uh, also thanks again so much for having me here. It's quite an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Applebaum. Now, let me, before getting started with the discussion ahead, let me inform you about the way to proceed. At 4.30, 45 minutes from now, we have planned video conference with a third guest, with a third witness here, Mr. Arlen Rusbridger, the Editor-in-Chief of The Garden. So we've got some 45 minutes to go for the discussion, and uh, I suggest we get started by the rapporteur, the shadow rapporteurs, and then some additional floor for the members willing to intervene, but I just remind you that this is a hearing. So we're here to discuss or to put specific questions to our witnesses here from this side of the podium, not to, I mean, not to linger on political statements uh, 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 for an unlimited time, but to concentrate on the, on the, on the, on the presentations we've heard from the journalists that have been invited to attend this hearing, so I suggest you have it in mind before opening up the floor. First floor goes to Mr. Claude Moraes, Rapporteur. Thank you, Chairman, and, um, and thank you to the journalists who have, have come here. Um, and essentially, they are the messengers who took what were essentially allegations from whistleblowers, and we're very grateful uh, for their contributions. We're going to hear from Alan Rusbridger as well, and collectively the, this is the information we had from the whistleblowers. But they are also opinions, and it's going to be interesting to hear a bit more of, of those opinions. Uh, Jacques Follereau, um in his articles in Le Monde, I think were groundbreaking, because what we're doing here today essentially is not just listening to what happened on PRISM, which was the U.S., program, but really examining what happened to EU citizens um, and their mass data wherever that was examined. And what you did in Le Monde was talk about how the French intelligence agency, the DGSE, 
um, essentially um, accessed the mass data of its own citizens. And what you did in those articles was talk about how the police and other agencies had access to what was essentially data which should have been um, accessed only by the intelligence agencies. And my question to you, taking the cue from our chairman uh, to be precise, is that as a journalist, you can have an opinion on what was happening in France uh, where it was completely inappropriate for that data to be taken elsewhere. And if this is happening in France, of course, we know it's, it could be happening in other member states. And the purpose of our inquiry is not to just shift the focus to what was happening between us and the United States, but is this happening in each member state, in your opinion? And is there a legal base in France for this to be uh, happening for mass data through different agencies? So in your exploration and investigation and through your sources, is this something that is just commonplace in each member state? Was it happening in France for a long time? And, you know, if it's happening, was it happening for a long time before the whistle was blown uh, by Edward Snowden so that we had this effect of suddenly journalists telling us about it? So that's my question to you uh, via Le Monde. And for Jacob Applebaum, quickly, um, your contribution was so rich, we could have had that contribution at any point in our, in our um, hearings. So really, I just want to ask you, I could have asked you so many questions, but just one question about everything that you've said, just the question of proportionality. Um, you talked about tempora, you talked about all the issues, including about my member state. Just one question. If all of this is happening, uh, just your analysis of what they're doing with this information, what is the purpose of this mass uh, transfer? You know, what is the purpose of, you know, putting billions into this mass transfer of information? Is it a commercial activity? It's not just to deal with terrorism. What's your analysis of the purpose, which you didn't go into? Thank you, Rapporteur Claude Moraes, for sticking so concisely to the timing and to the point. We follow with the shadows. The first floor from the shadows goes to Mr. Axel Voss. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich, um, achso, müssen Sie... Thank you very much for the information that you have provided to us. From my side, it would be interesting to know what your opinion is so to what extent this data surveillance is uh, something that clearly we criticise, but uh, to what extent this data is actually used. Now, uh, is this uh, data used against uh, other countries, for example, or industrial espionage? Perhaps you could give us some kind of idea in your opinion with regard to the new technological developments that we have is there a possibility that could be used to guarantee security with uh, that would guarantee people's personal rights more because we always have this uh, certain concern between people's personal rights and security trying to find the right balance so it would be interesting to know if you have any ideas, perhaps, uh, and uh, uh, do, do you think the intelligence services are considering uh, other possibilities that might be less damaging? Do you have uh, proof uh, that this data is being used for more than just uh, fighting criminality? Mrs. Interveld. Um, yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the, the, our two uh, guests. I've been listening with great interest. Um, um, <clears throat> I think the key question of this inquiry is going to be, I think, not 
how much governments know about us because it will probably be easier to establish what they don't know about us, which is far more limited. But why our system of checks and balances seems to fail? I think that's also essentially what Mr. Folleroux said. Why is there no reaction and why haven't we got the institutional uh, well, checks and balances to make sure that systems like these don't run out of control the way they have? And I wonder, given that you're both... Uh, here as representatives of the media, I, I wonder about um, the impact on the media, because this doesn't only affect individual citizens, it, it affects media freedom, as we have also seen with uh, journalists of the, the Guardian. And I wonder, do you, how do you co your colleagues respond to this? What is the response of um, associations of journalists, um, uh, trade unions of journalists, uh, are you aware, for example, yourself, that you're being, um, uh, that you're under surveillance? Do you, uh, I mean, are you harassed or, or, or under pressure in any way by uh, the authorities? Don't your colleagues feel that if, for example, the journalist of The Guardian is being harassed, that that might happen to them one day uh, as well? So what does this mean for freedom of the press? Uh, are journalists concerned and wouldn't there be good reasons for journalists across borders within Europe but also uh, transatlantically to, to join forces, work together and, uh, and also exercise your role as, as watchdog um, of democracy? Thank you. Thank you. Now, Shadow, Mr. Albrecht. Thank you very much and uh, thank you also for these uh, very interesting uh, answers uh, and remarks. I would have uh, some questions to all of you. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Folou, you uh, have mentioned the question that you, uh, first of all, want to know if there is control. Um, control means if there, if there is something going wrong or right. And uh, obviously, there the question is also about the legal uh, fundament of all this. And uh, there would be my question if there have been um, legal uh, concerns also, or if you have also legal concerns, or your colleagues, if there are uh, uh, cases also brought forward uh, on these programs. Because um, if I listen to this program, from the side of a lawyer, I have to say that these programs uh, are not compatible with Strasbourg court cases. Uh, so the question of the compatibility of the ECHR, which France also has signed, uh, is a big question. And uh, I would like to know how uh, that is seen uh, in, in France and how you also are uh, dealing with, the, with those questions. Uh, and also further, of course, we are in the European Parliament here, and the case why we act is, of course, because there are the EU treaties and the Fundamental Rights Charter. And the question also to you is uh, in how far you would see that those, like the binding Fundamental Rights Charter, should be applied to those programs or to those intelligence services or not. And uh, if that is uh, somehow also something which you would uh, uh, get into... Uh, uh, your work, or if, you, if somebody looks at that. Um, and to Jacob Applebaum, I, I would like to know um, in how far uh, you know if um, there takes place collaboration, a collaboration between uh, these programs and also other intelligence services of the member states, if, if you have any uh, information about that, especially with regard to this uh, X key score uh, program where in real time uh, communication data can be accessed obviously by quite a lot of intelligence services. And then of course uh, the question with regard to the, those who uh, at the end collect all these information, uh, which in many cases obviously have not been the intelligence services, but as you have li uh, lined out, it has been uh, communication services, uh, in how far uh, uh, there is a knowledge about the legal framework under which they work here in Europe, for example, where we have uh, data protection rules which also are applied to companies like Yahoo or 
Google acting here on the European market, uh, in, and in how far there are debates about uh, that these laws, also the existing data protection laws here in Europe, uh, normally would not allow the, to disclose personal data from the European market, from European citizens, to third state authorities without a mutual legal assistance treaty. Uh, so uh, there I would like to uh, get some insight from your side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, also Shadowfrau Ernst, and then we move on to the rest of the members. Please mind the timing. Yeah, vielen Dank. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to our two speakers, our experts here. I have a couple of questions. Now, listening to everything that's been presented here, we really uh, see uh, a myth crumbling here that we can uh, control our own information. So how, how do we proceed from that? It's not just what it means for, for one person or another as an individual, but how do we deal with this as a whole in terms of people's rights? Uh, I have the question as well uh, from the journalist for, from Le Monde. How do we deal with the freedom of the press? How do you protect your sources, for example? Is it still possible to ensure the anonymity of your sources? So not just a, a question for journalists, uh, really. So that's a very important uh, point. I think also in generally we have to ask, does this change the way that journalists work? Do you approach uh, things in a different way? Not just journalists, but all those who are affected in this area. So that's a point that interests me particularly. And the other issue I wanted to raise... is to do with uh, scrutiny and control. So when we hear about this uh, wide-reaching uh, global surveillance, it, it's, it's hard to imagine, really. So then we have this issue of control or parliamentary scrutiny. This is something that comes up here when we work a lot, uh, that there should be control uh, uh, to uh, avoid uh, this type of uh, surveillance. So w what's the situation with uh, parliamentary scrutiny, Mr Applebaum? I is this something which is possible? How far can we go with that? And I think uh, we need to look at legally what can be done to try and counter this. This surveillance mechanism we have, we need to think about some type of way to control this or to stop this. Thank you. Move on to the rest of the members. We've got a number of colleagues willing to take the floor. So please mind two minutes each so that our guests do have time to react and answer the specific questions that have been made. We get started by Mr. Coelho. First floor. Two minutes. Merci beaucoup. Alors, d'abord, je veux remercier. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Fellahou and to thank uh, Le Monde for their work and I wanted to ask two specific questions. So who, who was your work uh, destined for? Was it for French citizens, European citizens uh, of third countries? So who were the main victims really of the French system? You talked about cooperation between uh, police authorities other authorities also have the uh, capacity to go to GGSE and to ask for information. So do you have uh, information, for example, of cooperation with intelligence services from other countries? We know that the national uh, judicial uh, scrutiny or parliamentary scrutiny has been weakened already on this type of surveillance. And if we have this from one country to other countries, then really we're in a scenario where there's no checks and balances at all. Thank you so much for uh, your briefing. It was very interesting. Uh, 
your briefing on new technologies and new programs. Uh, I thank you so much. When you are headline now, they are spying everybody. I remember, I thought, I think it was Alexander Haig, one of the highest uh, American responsibles, who said um, the Americans has a global interest in the world, so they have to spy on everybody. So it's them uh, acknowledging uh, that. And uh, I thank you uh, because you underline well, in my opinion, uh, the, the sharing between the, the secret services without any control. But you spoke about encryption. And I remember this parliament in 2000 and 2001 approved one of the recommendations to uh, generalize to enlarge the use of encryption in order to protect citizens. And I think this is the question we should asking right now, how can we protect our citizens against these spy networks? Can you elaborate a little bit more? Thank you so much. People, two minutes, please. It's two minutes. Thank you. I want to speak in Thank you very much. I'll speak in German. The NSA scandal really revolves around uh, this massive surveillance and what this data is being used for. Now, what happens to the data where no evidence of criminal activities or terrorism is found? Mr. Fulohu mentioned another point, uh, which isn't just an issue in France, I think, but in other member states. And it's probably uh, somewhat uh, separate from this scandal. But we have these different intelligence services, the uh, police uh, authorities who are working separately. Uh, but that separation doesn't really seem to exist anymore. So I would be interested to know in the research you've done, the people you've talked to, if you found any answers. Uh, so not just in a formal uh, legal perspective, but if there are thoughts about the societal um, consequences when these different intelligence services are working together, for example. Mr. Applebaum talked about uh, the uh, European uh, Parliament, and I have to wonder to what uh, extent, uh, uh, what conversations, uh, if these are not open hearings or, or sensitive conversations we might have in our offices or what might happen to this uh, information. So perhaps a question you, you can't answer really, but an important issue nonetheless. You mentioned a number of different programs uh, that are used to collect this information and to monitor this information. Some of them we know. You mentioned some other ones. There's uh, also other ways uh, to to collect data, for example, uh, passenger name records. Have you carried out any uh, research uh, with regards to this uh, very wide-ranging uh, data that's collected? Is this uh, mix the data from dis different sources uh, and, and used in, in conjunction? Mr. Iacolino, two minutes. Two minutes for Mr. Iacolino. Thank you, Chem. There's no doubt whatsoever about the importance of the work covered by our guests and by responsible investigative journalism in general. We know how important it is when you're, you're dealing with organized crime to have police cooperation based on a relationship of, of trust, and the same applies if you're fighting terrorism. Probably, however, that level of confidence that Mr. Applebaum referred to, the trust we place in the security services, has uh, been undermined to some extent now in the light of this uh, massive spying over a broader canvas. Now, a number of previous speakers have, have mentioned that PRISM has its own characteristics. Other programs were flagged up, the, the GSE uh, in France, for one. But to come to my questions, the, the G6 um, Home Affairs Ministers will be meeting in Rome next week. The, the 
uh, European institutions will likely be represented too, and they're going to be looking at whether fundamental rights can be upheld in the security context. Now, the existence of these surveillance programs in individual member states, might that not be a, a way of clawing back some of um, the sovereignty and identity in the European context? And now another question, particularly to Mr. Applebaum. Who is behind Snowden? Is he a lone operator? Or is there there's someone else behind him? And then don't we need some sort of um, cost estimate of the, the prison program? Thank you. Gracias, Presidente. <coughs> Mi pregunta es... Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my comments are related to what's been said before. We have this uncontrollable flow of data now that seems to go between the different intelligence services. It seems inevitable that in certain occasions, certain uh, countries, uh, uh, we're, we're almost talking about a situation where it's a market uh, for information. Now, when it comes to encrypted data, I think it's clear that a lot of people individually are doing that, uh, but I don't think it's an institutional response. Uh, then uh, you'd have a, a corresponding market for encryption. I think what's really worrying about this uh, subject, this uh, information came to light through a newspaper, through The Guardian. What we haven't seen, though, is that... Uh, this, uh, if we see that terrorists really are uh, the exception in those who are being monitored, we have to look at this uncontrollable uh, flood of data. Is this really being used to control uh, terrorism? We would have to speak out very clearly and say that no, this isn't related to uh, terrorism, it's uh, other issues here such as a lack of scrutiny and so if we want to really be efficient in combating terrorism we have to have efficient scrutiny from Parliament. Antini, two minutes please. Two questions, Chair. Please. First, um, to, to Mr. Applebaum, do I understand that what you call the Five Eyes program that the various uh, states that are involved there help each other out uh, um, uh, in uh, researching other citizens from other countries in order for them to stay between the lines of their own legislation, or is their own legislation not a real issue of concern? Could you maybe uh, elaborate on that cooperation of, the, or of, of, uh, of in, uh, intelligence gathering services, uh, including also European member states? You, mem uh, you mentioned uh, Germany. And the second question is, are there indications that NSA or other intelligence gathering services um, have penetrated computers of European citizens by, for instance, a botnet uh, and, um, or, or other techniques that I am not um, uh, familiar with? Uh, with uh, what's the state uh, of affairs over there? Thanks. Thank you. Now, <coughs> Mrs. Morvai, two minutes. Thank you very much, and uh, thank, uh, thank you so much for all the, all the fantastic work you have been uh, doing. Uh, I would like uh, to illustrate my point uh, with a quote from an interview uh, which I read recently in a Hungarian uh, liberal uh, periodical, and it's an interview with uh, Mr. George Conrad, who is a former dissident. Uh, during communism, he was a dissident uh, opposition uh, writer. Now he's an advisor to Mr. Barroso on the future of uh, the European uh, Union. And in the context of the interview, he was asked, uh, uh, what is your opinion about the scandal in the U.S., the Snowden case? And the answer is, I am not being very excited or worried about my phone conversations being listened to. It happened to me continuously during state socialism. Journalist. That wasn't right either, was it? No, it wasn't right, but it wouldn't be right either to end up in the air due to a terrorist attack. 
And then he goes on explaining that uh, he has nothing to hide, this typical uh, sort of, I have nothing to hide argument. And then uh, I read this nothing to hide uh, uh, argument several times, and uh, there's this famous uh, quote that uh, responds to it, uh, that the question is nothing whether or not you have anything to hide. The question is whether it's government who controls us or it's we who control the government. And my question is, uh, how are these two related to each other? In other words, all what you have been talking about uh, uh, today, all this mass surveillance, how does it affect uh, uh, the ongoing social movements that are going on for social change, for social justice? Um, and also, the obvious uh, question that's related to it, what does the Big Brother actually doing with, uh, with all this uh, data? And the question number two is, um, the US, U.S. government says they could prevent 50 terrorist attacks uh, with the help of this existing system. What, what is the right response to this? What, how would you reply to this argument? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Weidenhauser. Thank you, uh, Thank you very much, Chair. Now, when you hear reports like this, it makes you feel somewhat powerless. So... It's good uh, that uh, Mr. Fuller who tells us that uh, uh, at least uh, gets us to be gets us to think about what Parliament can do in this uh, context. Uh, we heard about uh, whistle uh, blowers. Now, how would you evaluate the role uh, as a whistleblower? Is this someone you would consider as a spy or are we talking about a new age for our fundamental rights here the second point you talked about terrorism being an exception when it came to these activities so what exactly is being looked at then if that's the case and finally, just to either of the two gentlemen, the costs of the program. I'm sure this is a quite expensive, uh, this huge uh, technological involvement here, so I'd be interested to hear about the cost. Thank Madame Flotch. Two minutes. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, it's amazing uh, when we listen to you that we have to bear in mind that it takes a month to realise that uh, uh, Assad gassed citizens in Damascus. I wonder if you have an idea or any information uh, where we could establish uh, that this collection of data or transfer of data, this massive transfer of personal data has been put in place from from what particular point? I mean, I imagine this would have something to do with September 2001 and what ensued. And perhaps you have more specific information as a decision that was uh, taken um, and in what way. Another question on the type of cooperation between the intelligence services. Now, clearly, some of it is direct, some of it uh, between intermediaries, uh, companies, uh, other agents. Perhaps you could uh, give us an overview, uh, map out this uh, cooperation for us, uh, uh, almost a sort of a competition, perhaps, uh, uh, in terms of the information that can be gathered. Now, you say there isn't any parliamentary control or parliamentary scrutiny. The executive has all the power. Uh, at the same time, these agencies keep going. Uh, uh, the the uh, services keep exchanging information. The executive finds services already in place. They continue to use them. So it's almost as if it continued to work uh, based on a very deep 
core on a very deep level uh, that goes uh, beyond the uh, executive. So how exactly would you evaluate that? What is that based on the level of complicity there? Mrs. Senesin. Thank you very much. Based on the Eurobarometer data, 70% uh, of the Europeans are afraid that their personal data could be used in, uh, for the purpose other than they were uh, gathered for. Now, you have revealed that we should all be afraid of this uh, uh, because uh, the personal data of all uh, are uh, being used or may be used uh, for different purposes. To Mr. Folodo, Mr. Obama said that the Americans have no reason to be afraid because uh, the prison program does not uh, apply to the uh, to the Americans. And uh, how about uh, France? Uh, there was no reaction to uh, the information on their uh, surveillance. Does that mean that the French are not interested because uh, that surveillance uh, concerned uh, other nationals? Is that the case? Did it concern um, U.S. nationals? And to Mr. Applebaum, to what extent, in your uh, judgment, the uh, mass uh, surveillance that has been revealed serves the purpose of fighting terrorism, and to what extent it serves the pur uh, other purposes uh, that have nothing to do with uh, uh, terrorism and is uh, just a pretext uh, for creating the world uh, um, described in uh, Orwell's 1984. Please make it maximum two minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've heard from Mr. Applebaum that people uh, are under surveillance, extend beyond suspected terrorists, in his case, presumably because he's an investigative journalist. Uh, does it apply also to political activists who are disapproved of? In other words, what are the criteria? Um, to whom is the information imparted? Is it retained by the security services or is it handed to current governments who might use it for domestic political purposes? Is it used against job security of people in the public sector who are connected with organizations or causes that are disapproved of? Is it used to coerce people uh, into becoming security service informants, possibly even innocent people who are simply connected by family or accidental circumstances to people under surveillance? Is the data ever passed to autocratic governments that use it to take action against their opponents, either in the past or today? Um, is the data used not just to study individuals and organizations, which is not particularly dangerous, but is it used sometimes actively to disrupt individuals or the lives of individuals and organizations? We have had some evidence of that in the newspapers. Might security services of one country, and this is perhaps very topical, uh, pass deliberately falsified data to induce or legitimize mil uh, military action? such as in the case of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, perhaps rather a flippant question, how would those under surveillance know that they're under surveillance? Um, and I suppose finally, how might legislation be drafted that would allow legitimate surveillance into, say, seriously suspected terrorists and prevent illegitimate surveillance? Thank you. Thank you. Two minutes maximum, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is a slightly unusual situation for me. 9-11. For me. Uh, on 9-11, I was a journalist uh, in, uh, on Manhattan Island. I happened to be there, and I took a taxi down to, to uh, Ground Zero. After that, I spent almost four years reporting about very sober reactions and uh, some very hysterical reactions. So my take would be that after that incident, you had uh, all the Western intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies actually doing this as far as they could with the means they had and without any legislation actually hampering them. And the, the reason is, of course, that you have no 
uh, in the cyberspace, you have no national borders. So you can't say that, oh, this is the Finnish part of the cyberspace, this is the Swedish part, this is the American. So they did it because it was, they were able to do it. Uh, so we have actually a sort of semi-international of Western intelligence organizations doing this. That would be my take, and I would actually just like to hear if your take on this problem is more or less the same. Thank you. Thank you. And Honorable Borghezio. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. I think there's a bit of hypocrisy on the part of us politicians. Here we are um, putting on sackcloth and ashes. So, implies to information providers. Uh, what, and unlike our guest speakers, they are getting to the point. But the others um, have described this scandal going on about these revelations and alarmist tones as if this, this was something we couldn't see coming. But this is simply part and parcel of the new world order. It, its um, natural expression is total control of, of information and, and people. That is the starting point. And on that basis, may I ask our, our two very intelligent guest speakers whether from their detailed, serious uh, analysis that they've carried out into the technicalities of this, whether we don't encounter the following problem. What, 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 what responses have they, they come up with? If you look at the the, the problems uh, flowing from this this scandal that investigative journalists have been decrying, isn't there really a real secret uh, power in in the background? And what we're struck by is is the fact that these intelligence services are exchanging information, but what we don't really know is in whose hands that information ends up and what use they put it to. Undoubtedly. They're having a major impact on the economic and financial realities of the world. But to, to, to what end and how, how has that been channeled? At a time when we're saying that a number of important decisions need to be taken by secret or partially secret bodies on a bilateral or multilateral basis, we can't escape from this worldwide control of information. It's bound to come under the sway of secret powers who take the real decisions uh, above and beyond the supposed democratic decisions of our institutions. Of colleagues that have taken the floor, asked for it, have been numerous. So we've got a situation here, which is that we have scheduled a video conference with the third guest, with the third speaker today, which is uh, Alan Rosbridger, the editor-in-chief for The Garden at 4.30. And the timing of this video conference is also very strict. It's going to be limited up to 30 minutes. So okay. I, suggest, I suggest that we have some additional minutes to go, some no, the next... There, there in the video conference. Okay, ready to go. So I was suggesting first we could hear some answers from our guests, no, Monsieur Folorou and Mr. Applebaum, but I suggest we go right away, right forward to our third guest, Mr. Roos Bridger. We thank you for being here. Thank you for sparing some half of an hour with all of us. Thank you for being ready to talk to us on a video conference. We are honored to uh, share with you your views yeah. on behalf of your, of your work in, 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 as editor-in-chief of, 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 of The Guardian. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me just uh, welcome you, as we have done with the previous speakers, and uh, remind all of the members here in the, in the room that The Guardian published this summer a cooperation between the National Security Agency and the Governmental Communications Headquarters, GCHQ, the Tempora program. And uh, 
recently, more recently, the so-called Miranda case. Actually, Miranda 2, as there was a Miranda, legendary Miranda 1, by the U.S. Supreme Court in, in the 1960s, 1966. So we've got here a most relevant, a most relevant testimony to hear from Mr. Roos Bridger. We thank you for being here. We appreciate your work. We're going to give you the floor. If you ma can make it to a maximum 15 minutes so that we can still have some additional time for a limited number of questions before turning back the floor to our previous guests, Mr. Folorou and Mr. Applebaum, to respond and react to the uh, questions that they have listened so far. Mr. Roos Bridger, you've got the floor. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you for uh, inviting me to take part in this discussion. Um, it seems to me a, a, a very important one to be having, and uh, I will try and cover three areas. One, one is about the nature of the debate. Uh, one is to try and inform you uh, about our reporting and uh, how we've gone about it. Uh, and the other is to touch on what I think the role of... Um, lawmakers and parliaments should be. Uh, I'll return to this, but the, the overall scope of what we've been writing about uh, and why it matters is uh, the subject matter that you're exploring, which is about this new thing in uh, intelligence, which is placing uh, mass populations, entire populations, under a form of surveillance. And that seems to me something that is new, uh, hasn't been debated properly. Uh, it's something that uh, everybody from the President of the United States down says has to be debated, uh, and yet there has not been the information on which to base that debate. Uh, and that is why the role of reporting and whether countries encourage that reporting or try to suppress it uh, is such an important one. So perhaps I can just tell you uh, a little bit about uh, how this story came into being uh, and how we've been attempting to report it uh, and uh, the challenges uh, and responsibilities of doing so have worked. So in uh, mid-May, uh, as I think is, is known, we were approached by uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, and I, I think it's important to understand uh, that he approached, in a sense, two entities by coming to us. He approached the individual journalist, uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, who, if you like, is part of The Guardian, but also part of what we might call the fifth estate. Uh, the, the new digital uh, uh, sphere of information uh, which is not just traditional journalists. So uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald is a lawyer, he's a blogger, uh, and he's a journalist. Um, and he was approached by Edward Snowden because he wrote so knowledgeably and uh, responsibly and in such a, an informed way about this subject. And I think Snowden recognized him as somebody who would write about this knowledgeably. Uh, and he also writes for The Guardian, which is a paper that has a monthly worldwide audience uh, of something like 80 million uh, unique browsers. So it is a, it's a highly important vehicle for debate. Uh, but, Edward, but, but Glenn Greenwald is, is both part of this new world and part of The Guardian. Uh, the writing of the story has been a complex one, partly because of the subject matter. So the subject matter is about the penetration of communications uh, and the ability of agencies and states uh, to be inside uh, emails, phone calls, texts, messages. Uh, and these, this presents a problem for journalists, uh, and it is one of the themes that we have been exploring about whether journalism itself and whether having confidential sources is possible in this new age. So a world in which uh, Greenwald, an American citizen living in Rio, uh, an editing team in New York, uh, and at various times the story taking place in Hong Kong and Russia, 
and trying to edit it from London uh, is one that engages many problems, uh, including legal ones. So you have a different set of legal rules in America from uh, those that exist in London, for instance. Um, the material, examining the material involved uh, problems of security and how you would securely uh, look through this material. It involved fine editorial judgments about the responsibility of what was involved, and I would like to just say a little bit uh, about that, that we were clear from the outset that we were not going to do anything that would uh, identify agents, uh, that would compromise uh, operations. We were not going to treat this material as a kind of brand tub uh, to, uh, to search for, for stories. Uh, I think we have behaved responsibly, and in some of our discussions with the British government, this has been acknowledged, uh, that we've behaved responsibly. We have been, uh, in 90% in of the stories, we have gone to uh, the, the governments and companies in, in advance, uh, and listen to their response. Uh, and uh, I think we have acted responsibly throughout in our reporting. Uh, at some point, we have run across the laws I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the laws in different countries make this kind of reporting either difficult or impossible or, uh, or allowable. Uh, and it will be obvious, I think, to uh, the lawmakers that are sitting there listening to this, I hope, uh, that there have been at least two uh, instances where we violently disagree with the way that the law has tried to interfere with our reporting. Uh, one was the use of terror legislation uh, to intercept and uh, detain uh, David Miranda who was part of the team of people uh, at The Guardian, uh, and the other was the direct threat from the British government that they would use the law to prevent us from uh, to, to either seek the return or the destruction of the material that we were looking at. Uh, and that is why we are now in collaboration with uh, American partners because the American laws, the First Amendment in particular, offer a more robust protection for this kind of reporting than exists certainly in Britain, but I would guess in, in much of Europe. It seems to me that Article 10 is not the same as the First Amendment of, of the United States, and working in a country where prior restraint of publishing, uh, stopping, public, stopping things from being published in advance, uh, is not possible uh, in America, uh, and and therefore uh, we're, we're in this new journalistic environment which we are taking advantage of, in which we take advantage of the best legal uh, regime in which to publish uh, in examples where states move against and try to prevent reporting uh, in uh, within Europe. Uh, so that is how the story came about. Uh, that's how we've been uh, trying to work on the, this material. Um, there have been uh, issues of uh, security communications that I've referred to. There have been issues of security of uh, the material. Uh, it has, as I've tried to emphasize, been an exercise in teamwork. Uh, there, are, there are several reporters and editors who have worked alongside uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, and uh, used Glenn Greenwald's expertise and his knowledge combined with our editing skills, our legal and IT backup, the kind of things that a newspaper, uh, a, a proper newspaper, a well-resourced newspaper wanting to do journalism in the public interest is still able to do. Uh, we will have at the end of it, I think, enormous legal bills uh, in trying to defend and enable uh, our reporting, but that, to, me, to my mind, is something that a newspaper has to be uh, able to do. Uh, and we have entered partnerships, uh, as I've referred to, with the New York Times and with ProPublica uh, in order to uh, 
enable reporting that it turns out is uh, impossible to do in the UK. I just want to end by talking about why this story seems to me worth going to this effort uh, with all these challenges and difficulties, why uh, it is important that a newspaper does this kind of reporting uh, in a responsible way. Uh, and I, it comes back to where I started. In the old world, espionage was about state on state. It was a targeted activity in which uh, people um, used highly targeted techniques uh, in order to uh, spy on others. And what has happened in the last uh, period of 10 or 15 years is that this has moved into a world in which there has been a partnership of states and corporations uh, that we are beginning to glimpse through the Snowden documents uh, that has involved the mass harvesting of information of entire populations, anybody who uses digital equipment being put under some form of surveillance. Uh, and that seems to me is something which cannot happen without consent. It cannot happen without the consent of, of populations. And that consent cannot be given without information. You can't have the kind of debate that you are having today in your parliament unless you have information on which to base that debate. So you, so you can't simultaneously have governments trying to stop newspapers from publishing this and have that debate. So I welcome the fact that the President of the United States, that President Obama, even yesterday, uh, said that this was a debate that was necessary, uh, that just because you can do things doesn't mean that you should do things, uh, and he acknowledged that things had gone wrong, uh, and uh, that these were necessary matters of discussion. But you can't have that discussion without the information. Uh, and I acknowledge there has to be a balance. I think we all acknowledge there has to be a balance between security and privacy uh, and freedom of speech and freedom of association and the ability to report. But these are all things that have to be placed in the balance. And what tends to happen is that the security bit of the argument uh, is the only one that gets heard. So in the discussions that we have with government, of course, the security side of the argument says you shouldn't be publishing any of this. Uh, I've had senior officials within the British government saying you've had your debate, now stop. Uh, and it, to me it is not for the state to be telling journalists when to stop. Uh, it is uh, that that debate has to start now and that debate which can, that debate which is necessary in order to have the consent of people to employ these mass and new ways of uh, surveillance that affect everything that they do in their digital lives uh, can't be had without journalism. Uh, and so I, I welcome uh, the fact that you are having this debate. I think it's important that you should. And I think it is for all lawmakers in all countries in, in the free world, uh, which are going to be subject to these increasingly intrusive methods of surveillance, uh, because the engineers who are building this stuff will always be ahead of the laws. Uh, it is important, it's an important role of Parliament to consider these balances and to be, considering, to, to be considering how oversight is done and whether oversight is meaningful and whether the current oversight powers that exist through secret courts uh, and through uh, uh, the, the committees of Parliament uh, and Congress, whether these uh, oversight powers have been sufficiently exercised in the past and whether they're meaningful in the future. So thank you for asking me. Uh, as I say, uh, uh, what I've tried to emphasize today are these three things, that the need for the debate, the need for responsible journalism, uh, and the need for lawmakers uh, to protect that journalism uh, and to discuss the material that we are putting into the public domain at some risk to ourselves and, uh, and, and expense uh, and uh, against 
severe legal obstacles uh, and that lawmakers have a role to protect that kind of journalism uh, and to encourage that kind of debate. Thank you. We thank you, Mr. Bruce Bridger. We thank you for your work at the forefront of the garden as a key media player for the values we stand for, which are at stake precisely throughout this situation we've been dealing with. We thank you for being here to this video conference. We thank you for your contribution to this inquiry and to this debate. So let me remind you that there will be a second session, which is scheduled by 500, with some other three guests in order to review the temporary the works of the temporary committee on the echelon interception system. Namely, we've got our special speakers, our colleague Carlos Coelho, Gerhard Smith, and Duncan Campbell, which is also a guest representing media. So I suggest that now we open up, considering that the timing of this video conference is limited, we open up a short round of questionings addressed to our guest on the video conference, Mr. Ruth Bridger, maximum three, and then we turn back to our, to our previous speakers here, Mr. Folorou and Mr. Applebaum, so that they can react before the second part of the session. So you're going to be hearing, let's say, three questions, and then we will be thanking you for being here and moving on to our previous guests for them to react to the questions that we already heard. First law goes to Mr. Moraes, rapporteur. Mr. Rasprecher, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. I think everyone in this room knows The Guardian was a key player. Edward Snowden was the whistleblower, and The Guardian was the conduit in which uh, much of this information came to light. And it's important that many risks were taken and we got much of this information through The Guardian. Uh, so I'm going to ask the brief question, which I know many of my colleagues will not have the chance to ask, but uh, which I will ask. Uh, we're going to have a statement in Strasbourg next week uh, on the Miranda case, which I know was, uh, got worldwide attention and attention in the European Union as well. It was UK anti-terror laws which were applied, I believe, uh, perhaps inappropriately uh, to somebody who had information, uh, carrying information um, in relation to The Guardian. We also had the destruction of hard disks on the premises of The Guardian. You refer to both of these incidents, separate incidents. Um, my question is that given what you have done as an editor, as a responsible journalist, uh, given what's been happening to The Guardian, what effect is that having on journalism generally, on you and your journalists specifically? Is it having a chilling effect on journalism, on, on the freedom of journalists? Um, that's the first question. And the second question is, you refer to where do you go from here? Um, you talked about um, the question of you've had your debate, uh, now close it down. But where do you go from here? Do you now focus on us as legislators to do something? Or do you release more information, all of the information? Do you look for more whistleblowers? Or do you campaign for a change in the law? So where do you go from here? And these are the two questions I'd like to ask you, which I know many of my colleagues uh, would also like to ask, but perhaps don't have the time to ask today. Thank you, Mr. Morales. Now I will be turning to Mr. Foss. And we've got two additional requests by Mr. Albrecht and Madame Vejat, I suggest you stick it to one minute so that he can have a chance to respond and then back to our previous speakers. One minute, one minute each. Please, please make it short because otherwise we ain't going to make it. Please make it short because we're, as usually the case, we are, we are way back. We, we are dragging behind our schedule. Please make it short. Please. Yeah, vielen Dank. Um, it's Thank you very much. We have discussed the issue of the freedom of the press. Do you feel that there are certain limits on the freedom of the press when this touches upon security issues? I would be interested to know if you have the impression that uh, internal controls in intelligence services or parliamentary scrutiny, if that's just not present at all. I would also be interested to know if The Guardian has to pay for this information. Thank you very much. 
Welt. One minute, please. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Rusbridger, for your very uh, interesting uh, contribution. Um, uh, you mentioned legal charges. Will you bring charges against the government for the way they have obliged you to uh, destroy your computers, or rather they have destroyed your computers? Um, my second question is, um, I, I'm curious to understand why there seems to be so little concern amongst your colleagues across Europe. There are some people who are concerned, but why is there a massive um, let's say, uprising amongst journalists to protect their rights. Um, my third question is, do you feel that there would be a need for, uh, let's say, European legal safeguards for media freedom? As you said that the, the U.S. legal safeguards are more robust. And my final question is, I'm a bit intrigued by the, the fact that it, is, it seems to be the same people who were opposed to the recommendations by the Leveson inquiry for tighter controls of the media who have now called for the destruction of your computer. What does it mean for the debate in the UK? Oh, Mr. Albrecht, please, please stick to one minute because we are way back in, I mean, we're dragging behind and we still have to listen to our previous guests. So make it short, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Rusbridger. I uh, would have one question. Uh, would you think that a system, you mentioned that not everything which is technically possible uh, should be also allowed, a system which blanketly analyzes uh, all telecommunications information uh, would be in line or would be possibly brought in line with a free democratic society and with uh, free journalism? Thank you very much. Thank you. Madame Verjat, bref, je vous en prie. Oui, monsieur. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. I will be brief because my question is very much uh, in tune with what Sophie Intvelt just said. You just told us that the journalist protection system in the United States is much more effective and that is proved by the fact that you can publish things in the U.S. that you couldn't publish in the U.K. And you did say that uh, journalists should be protected by effective measures. So my question really is, do you have two or three proposals to give us in terms of European legislation that could help in this way? What are the priorities we should be focusing on? Thank you. Thank you, Madame Vajat. Back to you, Mr. Rusbridger. We thank you for your time and for your answers. First of all, you'll have to excuse my linguistic skills. So. Um, uh, I'll, I'll answer the questions in, in, in English, um, but, I, but the, um, the two questions that were not in English, if, if anybody can help me, um, uh, but I, don't have, I, I didn't get translation. But let, let me answer the questions uh, in, in English. The, the first question on the effect of, uh, of, um, on journalism of these interventions, the, uh, the use of terror, uh, terror legislation and the threat of injunction, uh, I can't help but answer that these will be chilling. These will be chilling and they are obstructive to journalism. Uh, there was a blog written by a former CIA uh, agent, uh, which I can supply the reference to, which indicated that these were perhaps techniques just to throw sand in the gears to try and slow down our journalism or to intimidate our journalism. I, I can't speak for the motives, um, but the effect of using inappropriate legislation and of threatening injunctions uh, is bound to be uh, 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 chilling to, to journalism. Uh, and the question of what this will do, uh, the, the, the question of the aspect of, of whistleblowers, um, I, I mean, I can't help thinking of the kind of whistleblowers that the West would like to encourage. So it, the argument has been put to me that uh, that there is an asymmetry here that we reveal the, the secrets of Snowden but we don't reveal the, the, the secrets of Chinese whistleblowers well we would love to have Chinese whistleblowers and Russian whistleblowers and Iranian whistleblowers uh, but we have to look at the signals that we send so if we lock if we lock up whistleblowers for 60 years in the West uh, as our way of signaling what we think of whistleblowers uh, how can we possibly encourage uh, Chinese or Russian or Iranian whistleblowers to come 
and talk to the Guardian uh, using the protections of the First Amendment or Article 10 in, in, in Europe. Uh, there was an interesting article in, in India recently about the whistleblowers that are, uh, have died in, 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 in India. The, the, these are the act of whistleblowers um, is something that, uh, to my mind, deserves some protection. Uh, and uh, so the, the combination of the use of punitive laws uh, against whistleblowers and inappropriate legislation to silence the work of journalists. Uh, I, I think people in, in, in Western governments ought to think about how these, the signals that we're sending to the rest of the world by this kind of behavior. That's the answer to the, the, the first question. Uh, the, the, the next question in English was about whether the Guardian would be pursuing legal charges uh, over the uh, destruction of the disks. I, I think the short answer to that is, is no, because this was a voluntary act by myself in, in order to defeat the, the, uh, the likelihood of, of an injunction that would be able to stop my reporting uh, and in knowledge that it wasn't going to stop my reporting anyway because we had copies as I advised the British government uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, so I don't think legal action is the right route for that. Uh, the, the question about why there hasn't been more concern in Europe, uh, I think it's, it's been patchy. I think in some countries in Europe, I felt very strong uh, expressions of support from uh, editors uh, and from free speech organizations. Uh, but I think, it, it, in, a, in a way, this dovetails with the, the question about the response in, in the UK and whether this is tied up with Leveson. Uh, uh, it may be that people are not stepping back and seeing the big picture uh, and how the, the, this behavior uh, by governments to inhibit uh, the journalism is directly related to the ability to have a debate about this. Uh, and for some reason, uh, and it may be to do with, with national cultures uh, and national cultures' experience of oversight of intelligence uh, and, uh, and the bad things that can happen when there is this kind of capability for uh, surveillance. Uh, I think maybe there are, there's a question of individual uh, cultures that, that informs the extent to which uh, people are concerned. But all I can say is there has been a very vigorous debate in some countries, a lot of support for what The Guardian has been doing, uh, and a lot of support for Glenn Greenwald uh, and for Snowden. Uh, so I think all, all I can say is that it's been a, a, a patchy response, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Leveson may be a, a factor that, that has uh, a particular traction on the UK response. Uh, there was a question, I think, about European safeguards, um, and uh, I suppose my answer to that is that, that I'm, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I know there is Article 10 uh, in, in Europe, and which is incorporated into, uh, into British law, uh, and I think it's an interesting question why, in the view of journalists, most journalists that I know, Article 10 doesn't have the same weight that the First Amendment of the American Constitution does. Uh, and I think it would be a common feeling amongst European journalists that we don't have the same protection uh, against prior restraint uh, uh, and in favor of free expression that exists uh, in the United States. Uh, and um, as I say, I'm not a lawyer, but, but I, I can only express my, my view uh, as, a, as a journalist. And one of the reasons why I think journalists should be more concerned about the picture that is emerging from the Snowden documents uh, is this one that journalism itself is potentially threatened by this degree of surveillance. So that the more authorities who have uh, oversight of material, and that doesn't have to be the content of emails, it can just be the so-called metadata, uh, i.e. who has been in touch with who, who is emailing who, uh, 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 and about what. That, that's all, or who has been searching for what in what search engine. That is, that is so-called metadata 
it appears to be harmless. Uh, it, it is collected in vast quantities now, but that kind of information absolutely tells you who journalists are in touch with uh, and who their sources are. Uh, and journalism therefore becomes deeply threatened by these techniques of mass surveillance. Uh, uh, and we found that all these mass surveillance systems are, of course, themselves not secure. That's one of the ironies of this story that uh, I've, I've had to sit there and be lectured by people uh, about our own security, uh, where the only people who have so far uh, leaked material have been the agencies that are supposed to uh, keep this material safe. Um, in, in terms, I think, of the, the final uh, question uh, in English, and I apologize again for not answering the questions that were not in English. Uh, that, that's um, my, my British um, linguistic skills. Uh, which I'm sure you're familiar with in the Parliament. Um, the, the systems of, of, of oversight that, that somebody uh, asked about, the, the alternatives, I, I think that comes down to the questions of, of, of uh, oversight. Um, some, somebody asked whether th this kind of mass collection of, um, of data was reconcilable with free societies. I, I think the answer does come down to the oversight systems and whether secret courts are an appropriate mechanism for dealing with them or an effective mechanism, and we're getting some sense of how the Pfizer courts uh, work in the US uh, and the extent to which their critics are right when they accuse them of being rubber stamp courts uh, or the extent to which uh, they are um, making um, robust choices. Uh, and I don't know uh, the extent to which the congressional oversight and the parliamentary site oversight uh, are effective or not, whether these people are regulators uh, or whether they uh, become uh, captured by the communities they're supposed to be regulating, because I don't know what they see. I don't know if they've seen the documents that we've seen or whether they see a small fraction of the documents that we've seen and there's no way of knowing because the whole thing is so secret. So I think my final message to the, the lawmakers uh, is, uh, as I've said before, please find ways of protecting journalism because journalism is your only way uh, to have this debate, this, this debate which everyone now says is necessary, but which government themselves are never going to encourage and the intelligence services are never going to welcome. So it is only journalism that is going to give you a, a, an inadequate and partial view into this world based on what a whistleblower has given us. Uh, please protect us as, as journalists uh, and please think about these mechanisms of oversight and how oversight can be meaningful uh, and whether it has been meaningful. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know who can do that job, but it, it seems to me it, it has to be lawmakers and they have to find ways of comparing the material we, ha we have. Uh, and I would welcome any thoughts the European Parliament have on what should happen to this material. Uh, comparing the material, the raw data, and comparing that with what the oversight committees have seen because then you will have some sense of whether the supposed oversight bodies are operating in, in an informed way or whether they themselves have only a very partial view of what has been going on. We thank you, Mr. Rose Bridger. Thank you for your time. And if you can spare with us just one additional minute, not to neglect the questions that were made in language which is not English. Let me just tell you that our French colleague, Madame Verjat, made you a question about whether you would assess, whether you would advise step forwards being made from the European level to better protect media freedom and uh, freedom of information. And our German colleague, Mr. Axel Voss, made you a specific question about whether the Guardian has ever paid a whistleblower for their information. But if you allow me, He's going to retake the floor for a couple of seconds to rephrase it in English. 
Thank you very much. I had at least three questions. It was uh, regarding journalism. Um, do you have the feeling there are no bounds regard journalists, uh, even if national security are affected? Then do you have the feeling there are no control um, regarding the data internally or from the parliament or from a judge? And uh, the last one was, also, was already um, given. Uh, do you have to pay for the information? Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Bruce Bridger. Final minute. Thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, well, uh, on the payment, no, we, we, paid, we, we didn't pay for any information. Uh, the, the question about parliaments and judges, uh, I hope I've answered in my previous answer. Uh, and on the, on the question about whether we acknowledge uh, any boundaries of security, uh, of course, uh, as I think I said in my first uh, uh, answer, these are difficult balances. Uh, and I hope in our responsible reporting we have uh, made a distinction between things that uh, threaten uh, national security, where, where I don't believe we have gone, uh, and uh, and things about essentially civilian matters, it's, it's the civil life of, 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 uh, 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 of people who use digital communications, i.e. everyone. Uh, and there is a balance to be had there, uh, but that balance is not found in the response of intelligence agencies who simply say, you mustn't publish any of this. If we were to publish none of that, then, then you couldn't have a balanced argument because you wouldn't know what to put in the balance with national security. So th these are difficult questions. I acknowledge there's a balance. Uh, and uh, all I can say is it has to be for the responsible judgment of papers like The Guardian and New York Times uh, who, and Washington Post who, uh, uh, to make that kind of material, uh, that, that kind of uh, discussion in conversation with the intelligence agencies, but not only the intelligence agencies, because uh, there is a civil liberties aspect to this, there is a press freedom aspect, so they are not the only voices that have to be heard in this discussion. Uh, to my French colleague uh, 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 about the, um, uh, this, this business of, of European protections, uh, I, I think I come back to my, my previous answer. I, I don't fully understand why Article 10 doesn't have the full bite impact and protection uh, that I would like it to have. Uh, and um, certainly in, in the UK, in the UK courts, uh, we have, we, we certainly welcome uh, Article 10 uh, uh, and it is, it's proved a, 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 a useful um, arguing point, but it's still, I think in, in the recent jurisprudence, uh, most British journalists would not feel that Article 10 has had quite the force uh, in terms of protecting free speech that we would have hoped. We thank you, Mr. Alan Roos Bridger, Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian. We thank you for your contribution to this piece of conversation and your enlightening testimony for the work we've got ahead. So we thank you. We wish you well. Thank you. We Thank are you. going to back to our previous rapporteurs here from the side of the podium. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Opening time for the answers. We thank you for your patience and cooperation for this video conference. Now we're turning back to you, the first floor, to respond and react to the questions that you've heard. Monsieur Folleroux. Peut-être devrais-je commencer par les, les questions qui... Perhaps I should start with those questions that try to see all these issues in perspective. I'm going to concentrate on the French element, but I think that will link up to other concerns in other countries. We get the impression that the surveillance technology revolution since 9-11 flows from the emergence of the internet, first of all, and then something that's not mentioned quite so often in public, namely uh, the way the uh, um, security services were, were terrified by the, the fact that encryption was 
coming into public domain. They used to laugh at the time saying that if, if cryptology was available to, to everyone, they, they might as well make the security services redundant. For a number of years, there was very strong lobbying in parliaments and uh, governments to delay uh, the um, uh, availability of uh, en encryption to the public as long as possible. Now, in France, because of the technological revolution and the large scale of in interception and data storage, uh, surveillance has become an issue of sovereignty. What's at stake for the, the, the French services is to make sure that they can be independent. The French authorities, they, they feel, have to be able to form a judgment which will not hinge on uh, information from other friendly countries or allies. Who's being targeted? What can you do with the, the metadata which is being gathered on a massive scale in France too? Well, it's everybody, really. The metadata... You know, Alan Rusbridger mentioned the, the, the point that, that people are playing down the importance of this, but for the security services today, metadata is actually more important than phone tapping. People tend not to say an awful lot uh, on the phone these days, but on the other hand, thanks to all this metadata, you can reconstruct quite a lot of the details of people's personal lives. Who do they consult? Where do they go? How often? So today, you can put together all the, the pieces of uh, an individual's whole life. And when the French security services in the technical department's request information, what they start with is uh, the name of an individual or a company or an address. The DGSE gets its uh, supercomputers working on the case, comes up with some raw information, the metadata, uh, covering a, a predefined period. And the agency then... doesn't give the French um, counter-espionage or custom services, whatever it may be, the raw information. Rather, the DGSE provides some added value by making it possible to make sense of this metadata. That information, that added value, is handed over to French services who are subject to French legislation. As for the targets, it's true that in certain instances you might have um, uh, the terrorist suspects, but during the course of our investigations we were told more than once that inquiries were also carried out by the um, Interior Ministry's uh, surveillance um, staff into people they, they thought might pose a threat to the head of state. That could be anyone. If they see there's a potential threat, they, they can't investigate into that person. It might be a lawyer, it might be a journalist, or a politician, an elected member, an MEP. It makes no difference to them. If they think there's a risk to national security there, the operation will go ahead. And this, this is fairly wide-ranging justification, which is often employed. And the investigation will carry out without any monitoring body uh, having anything to say in the matter. Now, what's the position of the, the people in charge of these services? Um, well, they, they talk in, in, in terms of the, the national interest, defending the, the French Republic and its institutions. Well, again, the question arises, what sort of illegal... <coughs> world are we talking about here? What One of the heads of uh, one of the surveillance services says it, what they're doing is not illegal as such, they're saying it's outside the law. That there are various means that are used that are not covered by uh, legislation. 
on any number of occasions that they you hear them saying, well, well one day we'll, we'll come before a judge. Uh, that may scare some, but they, they work with that idea in mind. The judge is out of the picture in, in, uh, in their world. Their bosses have done everything they, they can of these to make sure that the judges keep their noses out of the surveillance sphere. Now, then we talk about permeability, the, the, the issue of sharing of m massive um, data on an indiscriminate basis. France wants to be on the same footing as other countries in the fight against terrorism. It wants equally effective and powerful tools to what its neighbours have. So the, the material which is uh, stored and um, scrutinised by these agencies uh, comes under police authorities. There's, there's one that works on international uh, networks, uh, working outside France, despite being based here, and that there are direct links amongst the heads of services and the DGSE and their technical services, so that they can obtain information on people who might travel from France elsewhere and return. Then the information that, that is obtained by the uh, events services is, is uh, dressed up in legalese, in the documents, they may say, on the basis of anonymous information. They find ways and means of concealing the actual origins of the information which is fed into legal proceedings. And that may give rise to a number of legal concerns. Clearly, this uh, intelligence was not obtained on the basis of uh, traditional comparison of the positions of the prosecution and the defence, as you find in the in the traditional conception of uh, legal proceedings. Mass surveillance, uh, of course, was uh, increased as a result of 9-11. That provided a real political justification for the, the setting up of all the technological systems. In France, there was a hearing before the Senate at which the former head of the DGSE stated in public that there was a shared database to which the heads of the main Western intelligence services had access. Um, th this is uh, to, to deal with terrorism, and everybody uh, uh, shares in this pool. They're, they're, they're very specific re requests between the, uh, the US and France. They, they can ask for a month's uh, data. You get electronic signals that have been intercepted in a given area. But also electronic uh, signals from France to the, the Sahel region or in the opposite direction. So you end up with a, a, a huge body of information which is being transmitted by the, the, the French surveillance agencies to their American counterparts without any uh, democratic scrutiny. I don't want to drag this out, but anyway, on the idea of early warning, I don't think we've, we've focused on this yet, but Edward Snowden's approach and the approach of WikiLeaks are very different. The media, the, the, the papers, have published material in a responsible way. There isn't total transparency here. They're, they're not just churning out absolutely everything in public in an indiscriminate fashion. So, as things stand today, well, I, I don't know if this will be born out in reality, but uh, as we see it, this approach does provide legitimacy for these revelations. It, it's opened up the debate on individual liberty. I, I think Edward Snowden is a, a, a credible figure. If people argue he was in Hong Kong and then 
he sought refuge in Russia. Well, Hong Kong was precisely a, a location where he had a degree of freedom f which allowed him to get in touch with uh, Green Walton and others. As for Russia, it's not... Uh, the country would have chosen in an, an ideal situation, but it, it's the country that offered him refuge. On the, the, the point regarding press freedom, obviously there is a potential threat here hanging over the media. Given the extent of surveillance systems set up in France and elsewhere, particularly in the United States, it, it seems clear to me that we're only at the very beginnings of our understanding of the, the, the system of, of interception and intrusion. Obviously, the main countries involved haven't confined themselves to using these uh, electronic uh, instruments purely to, to fight terrorism. This, this has been used in economic warfare and many other areas. Over the coming years, the, the press will continue to do their job, I believe that all countries, even those where uh, journalists in enjoy uh, a reasonable degree of protection, and this would include France, uh, journalists are going to come under increasing pressure. First of all, they will be intimidated. And thereafter, they, they might um, be taken to court. I think it's going to be a tough time for journalists in the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Folleroo. Now, and now again, again, as we are way behind our schedule, I'm going to suggest uh, another approach to the handling of the agenda for the order of the day of this inquiry session. And it is this. We are supposed to be moving on to session two, which is a follow-up of the temporary committee on the echelon interception system with three, three guest speakers in this particular chapter, our colleague Carlos Coelho, Mr. Duncan Campbell, which is an investigative journalist as well, we welcome, and our former colleague, Mr. Gerhard Schmidt, former MEP, who was the rapporteur in charge of the echelon report by 2001. And as we have been informed that he should be leaving by 5.30, I suggest, again, we thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Applebaum, for your patience and cooperation. We suggest that now we hear the witnessing of our former colleague, Mr. Gerhard Smith, and then we will be hearing the answers from Mr. Applebaum and moving on to the second session so that he can also meet his, uh, his further arrangements for the day. Mr. Smith, you got the floor. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Ich bedanke mich herzlich für die Einladung. Ich habe mit Thank you very much for the invitation. I talked to Mr. Coelho about uh, the uh, research and the results, and I am just going to uh, stick to uh, that that I've had experience with. Now he understands. Uh, all of the details himself. Now, just on the procedure, there's a difference with uh, Echelon, with Prism and uh, Tempura. We had the documents. It wasn't the same detective work that was necessary. Nevertheless, there is still work to understand the exact details. When you look at the files, the data that uh, Snowden made public, you need to really sit down and look at that to understand uh, the terms. They're not necessarily that easy to understand. So the end of the process, it's very important to understand exactly what this system is capable of. And only when you can fully understand it can you uh, politically evaluate it and draw conclusions from that? So it's very important to put that effort in and to really understand the full capabilities of the system. 
second, and I say this from experience, it's very important in terms of the report to do this uh, work very seriously. It's important to, and to look at all the uh, data carefully that you're putting in the report to check the sources, to check the plausibility uh, where this information comes from. That is going to really uh, improve the quality of your report. Um, just a recommendation when it comes to the work. I think you have up until December that at a coordinator level you come to a con an agreement about what you want to work on in terms of content so that there isn't suddenly a disagreement about how to proceed. This would uh, be counterproductive and, and you'd lose valuable time that you don't have. I would also say it's very useful to use the expertise uh, uh, from the American Congress, from the British Parliament, for example, they have excellent material related to the information that you are now looking into. Secondly, what needs to be uh, clarified now, the Echelon, Echelon um, study that I have experienced showed uh, the wide scope of what an intelligence service does, uh, what's, what's technically possible, what's uh, finance, what's in the interests of the country and uh, what's legally allowable. Now, we don't know what they do that's outside of the law, but if you look in a lot of detail about what the legal, uh, what's legally allowed for an intelligence service, that's very interesting to look at. That can be very helpful. Secondly, I would also advise you to take the necessary time to understand the technical process. So with the uh, communications, surveillance, how this is actually done, the machines that are necessary, uh, that are used uh, by the intelligence services, these uh, can be um, a technology uh, companies who make this, who, who put this on the market. There are also companies who are active in other areas who carry out data mining and they could, it might also be very useful to invite such a company to explain everything that can be done uh, around data mining. Third area that wasn't a problem at the time but is now the NSA now uh, has outsourced a lot to private companies, uh, around 70%. Uh, so it's not just within the NSA itself anymore. Uh, clearly, that uh, uh, is something I think we can see in the uh, Snowden case, the, the consequences for the security. So even, even their own, uh, even the phones that they use is outsourced. So uh, some of this is, uh, as I said, in the hands of private companies, and this can lead to problems. So that's something else you should look at in terms of the report. Now, uh, who can be helpful uh, based on our experience? Uh, governments, I think, won't have much interest in helping you. That was certainly our experience at the time. You might not always hear the truth. We were lied uh, to uh, from the American and British uh, side as to this uh, agreement they had, this cooperation they had, and, and of course there was this agreement. If you look at national parliaments, you will see that there uh, they're not necessarily willing to share their work and uh, they don't necessarily want someone from the EU there either. So these are all things that you have to bear in mind if you want to invite an oversight committee, for example. Investigative journalists can be extremely 
helpful um, to give you uh, tips here. But it's also, as I said, important to look at the sources and the plausibility. There are two types of investigative journalists, those who are truly investigative journalists and those who are creative journalists, shall I say. So there are those who are more interested in just selling a story than in the truth behind the story. So I'm simply saying, uh, take everything with a pinch of salt. Don't take everything on face value. You need to check this yourself. The next issue is security uh, within the EU institutions. We've heard that the Washington uh, representation uh, has been uh, bugged. Countries uh, don't have friends, they have interests. So that's what we need to remember. For us, it's very important. And even back then, we uh, criticised the lack of uh, counter-spying uh, measures that we had within the EU. We don't even have uh, the countermeasures a big company would have in place. So I'm talking about the Commission, about the Council. I don't think it's acceptable that the uh, EU representation in Washington doesn't have a, a proper secure room. Other embassies have that because uh, you, you know that you might be spied upon even amongst so-called friends. It's also important to look at certain issues and if they're in line with EU law, looking at national uh, legislation, what uh, can be used as safeguards. Now, when I had sent an email, for example, from one country to uh, another country, it was over the shortest distance. But today, you don't know exactly uh, where this uh, data packet goes. It could go via America or go via China for economic reasons. But you can put national legislation in place to say that national legislation has to go through national channels. And uh, this, in, in this particular case, that could be something that's useful. Uh, secondly, those uh, on a flat rate... If you have a flat rate, you need to be aware uh, when you look at your uh, data and how that is processed and how that's used. Now, it, this can be outsourced to American companies, for example, and then they have the right to look at this metadata. So... You have to look very carefully at the billing and to see uh, if you can uh, what's happening with the processing of the data and if that's going out of the country. And if you're going outside of the uh, EU, you, then you're going to have problems. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and apologies for having to leave you. Vielen Dank, unser. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much to our former colleague, Mr. Schmidt. Okay. Yes. Now, we turn back to the first part of the session, which is back again to Mr. Appelbaum to answer the questions that were addressed to him, and then again moving on to the second part of the session with our colleague, Mr. Coelho, and the guest speaker, Mr. Campbell. Mr. Applebaum, the floor is yours. Thanks again. It's a tough act to follow. Um, the, that, that report uh, on Echelon that Duncan Campbell was involved in, that he was involved in, is very influential for me in, uh, in learning about cryptography and also in considering that there was hope for resisting surveillance uh, or that actual legislators cared about the surveillance. Not every single person thought it was legitimate for it to be secret. So... Um, 
uh, a couple of things uh, I wanted to, to do. I guess there's there's a ridiculous number of questions to answer, and I'll try to sum up my answers as quickly and as succinctly as possible. Um, one thing I wanted to encourage is that this topic is very dense. It requires what we had in the United States we call the church committee. We require a church committee in the United States again, basically, because we need subpoena power, we need the ability to actually ask people who are in a position of power, who are not in a political position, to answer specific questions. So as an example, I would really encourage any of you that would like to help, help, help myself or Duncan Campbell to get our dossiers from all of the relevant intelligence agencies in the world. If you'd like to see what the capabilities of these systems are, I assure you that between the two of us, we have some files that are worth reading. Um, I, he has to consent, but I consent. Feel free to put it on the internet as well. So um, that said, you mentioned uh, the purpose. I think that the purpose is exactly as stated. That is to say that it, the job of an intelligence agency is to assist with control. And slowing things down, as, uh, as Alan said, is, I think, one of the fundamental ways that this can help politicians, but in general it can help many different groups uh, to have a kind of control. So slowing down the publication so that you have more time to understand what's coming, so that you can shred documents, so that you can change program names, so that you can find out if anybody inside is planning to leak anything by giving them an extra polygraph and firing them or bringing them up on charges. Um, I think fundamentally the purpose of surveillance systems is control. And that is exactly what we see these systems being used for, right? So surveillance is not an end towards totalitarianism. It is totalitarianism itself, limited in scope at the moment. But when the Golden Dawn in Greece has access to the interception systems with their racist ideology, what will happen? Well, it will be very different with and without a surveillance system. In the history of Europe, we've seen this with the IBM punch card systems. Right? Those punch card systems are the difference between millions of lives, actually, in France and in Holland. So I think the purpose is clear. It's control. Now, what that control will be used for for the United States is very different than what it will be used for by the German services, for example, or by the British services. But we know, at least in the United States, that the surveillance data is used towards illegal wars. We know that it's used towards assassination of our own citizens without a trial. So in this sense, it's the ultimate kind of control, which includes the death penalty. So that's also a kind of censorship, if you will, an extreme form. Um, and then to the German, Herr Voss, I think is his name. Um, he wanted to know if uh, it was used. Uh, Voss. Voss, yeah. Uh, he wanted to know uh, some of the usage. And from what I can tell, there is definitely economic espionage. <coughs> economic espionage seems to be a key reason. And the US actually argues that it stops economic espionage using this, which I think is fascinating. Um, I'm not sure that that is true. I'm not exactly sure how to tell if that were true at all. Um, I suppose the argument is essentially your democratic process works really great for you, but it doesn't work great for us. But trust us, we're helping you. Um, it's definitely used for war. It's, in my experience, personal and professional and w with my colleagues, um, you know, political persecution. It's very clear. And, um, you know, what to do to find balance. Um, I think a key thing to understand here is that we have a whole bunch of spies, which is to say generally criminals, who are saying that we need to use them as a vanguard for securing ourselves. And the way that we do that is that we leave ourselves intentionally insecure in hopes that they will protect us. But in Germany in particular, what we've seen the government say is that German citizens, German businesses, they're on their own to protect themselves. And this is, I think, um, not the right balance. If the network itself is insecure, if all networks by design are insecure, we have some serious problems. And that, I think, is not the right balance. I think, in fact, when someone tells us that they are securing us, we should um, be secure. That's actually a fundamental prerequisite of that being an honest thing. And you know, to that end, um, Albrecht had uh, mentioned this question about collaboration between agencies. And I think that there is a massive amount of collaboration between agencies, and I think that it's apparent in what has been said in public and from the documents that have been seen, as well as in conversations that people have had with Snowden, as well as with other journalists that are involved in writing about these things. And in the 20th century, we could say that intelligence services, generally speaking, were working for their states against the rest of the states. 
and there were obviously alignments. And these days, it seems to be the case that all the intelligence agencies are collaborating with each other against us, which is terrifying, um, to say the least. But 70 percent, uh, I was speaking with Laura Poitras uh, a couple of days ago, and she was suggesting to me that the number is something like 70 percent of the SIGINT take comes from collaboration with companies. <coughs> So that means that we could secure 70 percent of our communications data if we incentivize, if we create protection in the way that we actually communicate with businesses and with each other, and to reduce that collaboration. Because it is not merely a question about whether or not the U.S. government or a European government has access to this data, but what happens when the Chinese government compromises one of those companies. In the case of Google, they were able to compromise, as I understand it, the FISA uh, wiretap system inside of Google. So the Chinese were able to find out who the foreign intelligence targets were in Google. So it's not about whether or not we trust Google. It's about whether or not we acknowledge that we don't get to make that choice. Someone else makes that choice, regardless of what the laws or policies say. And so towards what we can actually do, I think we need to actually <coughs> secure ourselves. So I have in my pocket here um, uh, a cryptographic uh, telephone which um, actually helpfully told me that there were some interception-like capabilities in this building. Um, uh, just as a side note, um, might be a bug, but uh, maybe it's a feature. Um, this, this phone, um, short of breaking into it, when I make a phone call, no one here, and short of a mathematical breakthrough, uh, is going to be able to intercept it. I have a couple different encrypted text messaging programs. I have the Tor projects, Tor uh, Orbot program. Um, I have CryptoPhone, <laughs> RedPhone, TechSecure, um, some other things. And so actually doing research into how to build decentralized, distributed, secure systems that are freely specified, openly specified, um, with no backdoors, with no ability to coerce the developers into adding backdoors, to actually embrace the idea of liberal democracy and to drive it home, that we have the right to speak freely, um, that is something which I think we really can do. And it's not like a pipe dream we, we can do it someday. It exists right here. And you don't have it, probably. But why do I have it? Shouldn't you have this? I think the answer is yes, you should. Uh, and most of you don't, and most of you are, without question, targeted. So, and, and, but the point is not this specific device, because you know, it's some prototype, but rather the point is that every single person in the world should have that when they <laughs> pick up their phone normally. Why is that not the case? And the answer is this fundamental tension between people that are supposed to keep us secure, and the way they keep us secure is by actually keeping us insecure, literally and technically. In the case of GSM, there was a different version of GSM constructed for export so that intelligence services could spy on some of those nations that would deploy it. And the Washington Post published a cost estimate. It's something along the lines of, um, I think it was $52.6 billion a year. So since 9-11, uh, more than half a trillion dollars for the intelligence budgets, the black budget. Um, I don't think that that, in, um, for example, encompasses all uh, things that I might consider to be that. I don't think, for example, the CIA torture and rendition <laughs> flights were in that budget. Um, and I mean, there, there's like so many uh, kind of like terrifying aspects to the way some of the questions were asked, just as a sort of meta point. Um, so like, for example, um, do Five Eyes uh, countries, that is to say UK, USA, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and United Kingdom, do, do they help each other out as a matter of um, circumventing national laws? And, and the answer to that is very clear, it's yes. Uh, there's in fact even uh, a place in Washington DC where some British and some American intelligence services share a building where they re, I've been told, I haven't been able to see it, I have some satellite photos of it, where it's a retransmission of information between the two parties so that one party can intercept on one side and the other party can intercept on the other. Um, this would be something that's worth looking into. I sort of hope Duncan, Duncan will do that in his spare time. Um, and then, yeah, has the NSA uh, compromised European computers? I'll just say yes to that. That's like totally, completely without question the case. Now, I wouldn't think of it so much in terms of computers. I would ask yourself about atomic power plants, hospitals, um, parliamentarians, uh, and I think the answer to those is also yes, in specific. So um, mm, I would be pretty upset. That's very serious because when these guys are messing around with control systems, for example, um, what happens when they accidentally do something to a control system and it fails? Who is responsible for that? Does that count as an act of war? Um, do they have any economic responsibility for it? Um, so there's really serious consequences when we start to talk about that. Um, 
And there's a lot of fear-mongering about so-called hacktivists or hackers, and not a lot of talking about how if the Chinese are so <laughs> terrible, for example, for having compromised a bunch of people and gotten caught, what are the NSA for having compromised basically everyone and gotten away with it? I mean, if the Chinese are concerning, it seems to follow that the NSA's total compromise of these systems is actually more concerning. Um, and there's a lot of psychological cost as well. I mean, I've been targeted by the U.S. government for the last four years for my involvement with WikiLeaks. So I have been targeted by 2703D orders. Those are administrative subpoenas, uh, sealed search warrants. Probably, if I knew, I wouldn't be allowed to tell you. Uh, other legal processes that, if they were to exist, I would not be able to tell you about their existence. Um, an FBI agent once actually let me know that eventually I did become aware of a national security letter, thus accidentally leaking that there was one. Um, and these kinds of legal instruments are terrifying, in particular because they use the language of terrorism about WikiLeaks, <coughs> which is nonsense. WikiLeaks is not terrorism. It is effective journalism. And in the case of indiscriminate document dun uh, dumping, as the French journalist had mentioned, um, it's important to note that it was actually the Guardian itself that made that mistake and not WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks took great steps to be able to redact names. In fact, they were criticized heavily by the free information world for taking the steps of redacting informants' names in particular. And the State Department actually stopped using that talking point after they accidentally leaked my name to some people, uh, which is just kind of a side note worth talking about later. But this kind of thing does not end with technology. It's not just that my computers or my cell phones have been compromised or that my accounts have been targeted legally, but my family members have been targeted. Um, my partner woke up in the middle of the night with men with night vision goggles watching her sleep in her own home. These kinds of things are a part of press freedom in the United States now, and they use uh, the language of terrorism. So when detaining me and seizing my property, they have literally called me a terrorist, denied me access to a lawyer, denied me access to a bathroom, and threatened literally my life in various different ways. And there are, there's tons of legal action that's going on, but as a result of all that, I live in Germany now. Because it is better to be an immigrant in Berlin than it is to be a citizen in the United States. Right? And that's, that, should, <laughs> that should tell you about the situation. And you can look at Glenn, who lives in Rio right now, and Laura Poitras, who is my neighbor in Berlin as well. And you can see that people who are working on these types of issues as journalists <laughs> their actions speak for themselves, regardless of whether or not they are brave in public. None of us are really in a hurry to go back to the United States and end up like Chelsea Manning or to end up like, let's say, James Risen. Right? This, is, this is fundamentally a huge problem because Obama does not actually stick to his statement about protecting journalists and, in fact, instead wiretaps them. The Department of Justice wiretaps them. And when Clapper lies under oath about NSA surveillance, we see exactly the same problem, total impunity for people, in some cases who are not even elected, and absolute ruthlessness for the people that are targeted by them as political enemies. And that's a, that's a very concerning aspect. And the only thing that I see that really seems to give me a lot of hope is that in Europe there's a huge debate about these things. And there's a really, really... Um, fantastically free press, despite the fact that the First Amendment is very good, there, there are many uh, American publications who literally run their articles by the CIA before they go to publish them as part of their not being persecuted or prosecuted strategy. That was, uh, I believe, what Bill Keller did with the WikiLeaks cables and the New York Times. Uh, you know, all due respect to the New York Times, none to Bill Keller. This is something that I think is totally offensive. And working with Der Spiegel, for example, um, you don't see that kind of collaboration. You see people who are in service of the truth, who do verify these documents, who are caring about what is actually happening. And this is something which just, I wouldn't do this from the United States again, um, at least not for a long time. So um, we should also address the myth that this is a post-9-11 issue. It is not. The NSA has been doing this kind of widespread collection, including on U.S. citizens, for a long time. Um, there's a program called Shamrock, which I would really encourage you to look into. And also another program, which was actually the FBI, um, it's called COINTELPRO, or the Counterintelligence Programs. This is where they tried to blackmail Martin Luther King Jr. This is where they went after a number of people. And the types of harassment that we see now, like what my partner experienced with the night vision goggles, what I've experienced being detained at airports, or having black bag jobs where people break into my house but don't leave a note to even mention it, um, that kind of stuff 
is like COINTELPRO, except it also happens electronically. And now, unlike in the 70s, the U.S. government asserts that it is completely legal. And in some cases, they might be correct, thanks to things like the Patriot Act. So, yeah, there's like far, far too much for me to actually answer every single other question. So I'll just be very brief here and say, um, you know, when Obama says that we don't need to be afraid, I think, first of all, it's insulting to every single one of you in the room. Because when he says to Americans, don't worry, we don't spy on Americans, I think, what about every other human being on this planet? That, to me, is something which is extremely, extremely upsetting. And I apologize on behalf of my incredibly insulting president for saying that about each and every one of you, because that is not acceptable in a civilized world. And he's also wrong, because my experience with WikiLeaks is that Americans have more to be afraid of. And, and, and the reason is because there is a system and a culture of repression that in some cases is so total, there are people that will not pick up the phone to talk for fear of the metadata alone linking them to my telephone. So in the United States, I basically don't have a telephone that people know about. I have one for an emergency, and it's never powered on. So um, is it used for coercion? Is it used and is data passed, for example, to autocratic regimes? Um, is it used to study groups? Is it used to disrupt? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, might they force or forge data? Absolutely. In fact, I've been detained at borders where they let me know how utterly in trouble I was going to be, but that they could not arrest me which is a very fascinating thing. And I'm not allowed to see this file. I'm not allowed to correct this file. I'm not allowed to know it. They've accidentally let me see the file while holding me in an interrogation cell. Um, their two-way mirror wasn't quite so good. And um, in this case, I said, hey, that data is wrong. And they said, well, no, you can't see it. I said, but I already did. And they said, well, that's, no, you didn't. Okay, so clearly someone makes mistakes. And whether it's an intentional mistake is a good question. But how, how do we do this to detect this kind of surveillance? It's easy. Do you use a phone? Do you have a tracking device? Do you make a call? It was probably intercepted. It's, the metadata is almost certainly logged. And in some cases, through outsourcing, the billing <coughs> of your cell phone data is sent, in some cases, to Israeli billing companies where they are cut rate because the product is actually your social graph. They don't care at all. Uh, about what they're actually doing billing-wise. So having some legislation where that kind of outsourcing isn't possible would be a really useful thing to do. And, um, yeah, so finally, I think, you know, the WikiLeaks spy files version 3 was just released yesterday and is continuing to be released uh, now. Um, this shows the sort of techniques that corporations have and the marketplace, the multi-billion dollar marketplace for surveillance equipment. And it shows the complicity with many of those exe executives, about 20 of them were uh, investigated by the WikiLeaks counterintelligence unit. And um, the WikiLeaks counterintelligence unit found that many of them were traveling from Europe to repressive regimes to sell to repressive regimes surveillance uh, software, so including targeting people that I personally know who are journalists in Morocco, uh, targeting people in places like Ethiopia, targeting people in places like Egypt. So this is something that I think Europe can, can do a lot with by actually stopping these types of exports potentially, or at least ensuring that there's a right of private action for anyone who is affected by it, so that when Hacking Team or Finn Fisher or any of these people uh, comes to such a country and then innocent people are harmed, that they have a chance of having justice here if it is not presented there. And Finally, I want to say privacy versus security is one of these points I keep hearing people touch upon. And I think it's absolutely critical to uh, do away with this, this talking point because it's, um, with all due respect, it's the wrong one. And the reason is because um, privacy is a function of actually having security. It, it, it is not the case that we will have privacy by having no privacy. Right? It just, it doesn't, it, that's not, it does not make sense. By having a total surveillance state, we, we can't say that our data is private when we have things like love int. If you're not familiar with this, this is the NSA term for surveilling your love interests. It's so frequent that they call it, like SIGINT, signals intelligence, love intelligence. Right? Unfortunately, it's not funny if you've ever had somebody do something like that to you. And so I would say that this is actually a question about dignity and agency and liberty. And these concepts rest on the concepts of confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity, but most of all, consent. 
And this is something which is not actually present in any of these systems. And so we are offered security, but we're actually given intentionally weakened systems that are exploited and used against us. And this creates a horrible chilling effect. And, well, maybe not horrible for Europe because many investigative journalists from America are moving here. But uh, in general, it's horrible for their families and their friends. And, uh, yeah, and there's a lot to be done about it. And research and development in the European context to decentralize and to secure these systems and to recognize that it's not the exception that we need this security. It should be the rule that we need this. That that will really move us forward in a very positive way. And we can start to change these things and to right these wrongs. So thank you very much. We thank you. We thank you, Jacob. We thank you. We thank you. Mr. Jacob Appelbaum, you certainly made a most compelling case. We thank you for your courage and your boldness, and certainly, it certainly, you, uh, you've, uh, you've addressed us, showing openness to state your mind, and you will certainly help us out to state our mind in the work ahead. So we really thank you for being here and for this piece of, uh, for this piece of uh, strong advocacy for, for the values we're, we are here to stand for. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now we move on way behind, as I insisted, to part number second with the, with the review of the Echelon Interception System Report, given the floor to the following guest speakers, our colleague Mr. Carlo Coelho go first, and uh, journalist Mr. Duncan Campbell, to whom we welcome warmly, goes second. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will be quite brief because uh, we have not a lot, a lot of time and I have other chances to speak and not is the case with Mr. Campbell, so I, I believe it will be more interesting listening to him. Four ideas. First, um, it was very, quite easy to chair the Echelon Committee because we could count on Mr. Campbell uh, investigation, and we had an excellent rapporteur, Gerhard Schmidt, who spoke to us before. Second, we proved echelon means uh, what uh, someone spoke about the five highs today, five countries, the United States of America, UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. They have a global network, they intercept communications, and they share inf information. Third, we proved that after the falling down of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States of America, the United States of America reoriented its network of spy from military targets to civil and business targets. And it is quite clear they were doing, and they are doing, economic spy. And it is, it is not a, an assumption from our side. It is something we proved. We spoke when we were in Washington with James Woolsey. He was a former director of CIA. And in any case, he, he, he wrote it in the 22 of March 2000 in the Wall Street Journal, an article called Why America Spies on Its Allies. The title of the article was not uh, are we spying or what are them arguing about uh, our activities. The title of the article was why American spies on its allies and it was the main uh, subject of the interesting uh, conversation we had with, with them. He has three reasons. I'm not going to, to speak on, about it on detail. You can read the article. Uh, it's in the America, in, it's in our European Parliament's archives on the Echelon Committee and the note about our talking with him also. Finally, uh, what uh, do I think it's different between 2000 and now? Uh, as Mr. Campbell will, will tell, uh, I'm sure, with more authority, um, at the time, that uh, Echelon Network could intercept phone calls, 
emails, fax, telex, submarine cables, radio signals, uh, doing satellite interception, and so on. But at the time, there was uh, a kind of uh, description, um, careful, doing spy in its own territory. That means when uh, the American uh, spy system needed to spy on American citizens, they would ask their British colleagues. When uh, the British uh, Secret Services did want to intercept communications in British soil, they were asking to their American friends. And uh, uh, Mr. Campbell uh, uh, collected a lot of evidence of this kind of cooperation, and our committee did the same. We collected evidence of those, those kind of cooperation. Right now, I don't think they need to do that, because I get the feeling the Secret Services are spying inside their own territory. And uh, despite the fact they are sharing information about their own citizens with other uh, secret uh, services. So it was what we were discussing a few minutes ago. The exchange between secret service services is being done without any kind of control. The last question I want to address, and I'm finished right now, it's if we succeed to prove everything in 2000, why we did not do anything in order to stop it. And this is, there is a, a clear uh, uh, answer. The Parliament approved the Echelon report two months before the terrorist attack of the 9-11. And after the 9-11, the there was an emotional environment, uh, uh, completely understandable, of solidarity with our American allies. And of course, no one did at the time put on the table the revelations and our proofs about uh, uh, this kind of uh, communications uh, interception and spy activities. And even about the proofs we had, they were spying on its allies and friends. Uh, nobody uh, did want to put that on the table. So I think we can say the terrorist attacks of 9-11 not only changed the perception of fighting against crime and fighting against terrorism and itself became a threat to civil freedom and, and, and some kind of uh, civil liberties we, we, we take profit for, but also killed the European Parliament's report on Echelon because it was uh, under the dust of uh, the terrorist attack of 9-11. Uh, and that's why now when we are speaking about prison, I have a feeling of déjà vu. Uh, everything it was already debated at the time. I think there are some kind of differences. The biggest difference, in my opinion, is the level of technology. And I can understand why the last uh, speaker told us uh, two hours ago, Echelon was kids' play compared to PRISM. He's speaking about the capability of intercepting communications and the kind of data especially the uh, metadata he spoke about. So I think it's the main issues I would like to raise. Uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Mrs. Invelt, I would invite Mr. Campbell <laughs> <laughs> to help us again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Chairman. Uh, chairman and uh, colleagues, um, I think it is indeed hugely ironic that uh, in my recollection it is precisely 12 years to the day, the 5th of September 2001, that 44 recommendations in the report uh, prepared by Gerhard Schmidt and adopted unanimously, as I recall, by the Parliament were passed. And it is indeed the tragedy and perhaps the lasting legacy after the vile effects of the attacks in Washington and New York that the terrorists managed to do so much harm to our civil liberties and our concerns for our own civil rights by their actions. But the years even before 9-11 saw confirmations even before what we have learned from uh, Edward Snowden. The 
decades since has seen the admission of the UK-USE agreement between uh, the United Kingdom's uh, GCHQ and the United States National Security Agency and the three other English-speaking partners. And we can go on to some wider agreements that are now revealed or about to be revealed. Um, even in the year we were reporting, it was discovered that the United Kingdom had built an interception facility in the northwest of England to tag all of the communications, again, this totality, not just the metadata, but all of the voice and other communications, by means of building a tower, and you see the tower there, um, to collect the radio waves behind opaque panels and below that eight floors of high-capacity processing equipment. In some ways, the echelon system was easier to track down and prove, because it uh, created highly visible artifacts, things that you could see, satellite tracking stations and towers like this, uh, compared to the situation now. This is the GCHQ Bude station, which is now remote processing center one for the collection of all the internet communications that they can get to hold them for three days. Originally, the satellite dishes were fairly obvious, pointed up at the satellites as part of the echelon system, but you also see in the upper top corner new buildings which were added for the Project Tempora that Snowden has revealed and we have heard so much about. But in the mid-noughties, there was also revelations that told us something of what was to come from the United States when an American technician provided plans and documents and pictures showing how optical fibers were being spliced into the internet exchanges of the American West Coast. Um, uh, many of us then started looking for secret rooms like these rooms around other exchanges in the, in the world to try and document it, but it was in fact not until 2008 that one journalist in Britain learned of what is now called the Mastering the Internet Project, a, a very strong and powerful name and which has turned out to have been spawned into Project Tempora with numerous um, uh, other stations now being linked in. The echelon system itself is not only still in being, but it has got bigger, and it's changed its name. There's the name. They just call it Fornsat now. That's one of Edward Slowden's slides. It was published in Brazil a month or so ago, and that's a map of all the echelon stations around the world, possibly a year or two out of date because it shows one in Germany that I believe now has closed, but it reveals that there are new stations um, in India, in Thailand, in Kenya, in Brazil, um, all part of the same collection system and run either by the United Kingdom or the United States and its allies. There's also a station in Oman uh, covering the Middle East. So the number of systems in this single part of the communications collection network has gone up, but it's only a tiny part, and now we know how tiny Echelon was compared to what was really coming through the technical development as this parliament met and reached its conclusion in that fateful year of 2001. Whoops. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Malfunction here. Uh, there's an example now confirmed. It's come off Snowden's map, but you will find the very same station in Japan, an echelon station, on the, the back cover of the Interception Capabilities 2000 report. This is the echelon report which I did for the committee and which uh, Mr. Schmidt and then looked into, validated and leading to the conclusions. More stations in the United States. But what is perhaps most interesting to understand is the collection of the different inputs that we now see being integrated together into a total internet usage analysis system that basically spans the planet. This is the system that's already been mentioned by Jake Applebaum and uh, briefly alluded to by others called X key score or cross key score. Um, it produces a familiar kind of data for people who work in the forensics of computers as I now do, because I, I had a sort of second career launched after working on Echelon here. But it covers everything, not just one computer, but everybody's computer. The inputs to this system 
are threefold, as you can see at the bottom. They're in obscure code. One of them, of course, is Fornsat, which we've just seen as the new name for Echelon and the satellites that collect commercial communications. The third one on the right-hand side, SSO, is Special Source Operations, and this is the standard name that the agencies now use for access to commercial cables, optical fiber cables, and sometimes internet or telephone switches by reason of secret or coerced agreements with telecommunications companies. And the third input, and this is quite an interesting revolution, it's down there as F6, which is just a division of the National Security Agency, but it's a division also known as the Special Collection Service, and that service is runs interception centers in United States embassies and diplomatic premises around the globe, some 75 or 80 sites, according to different documents. The critical input, though, for this system is to get access to the optical fiber cables, the submarine cables that connect uh, and carry out most of the world's business and commerce. Everything goes that way now. Echelon covering satellites is now the minor player. And as we've learned from the Snowden revelations, the United Kingdom has taken a particularly strong role in simply scooping up all of the Internet or attempting to do so. The news is that they haven't yet got everybody to take part in this operation. So as of about 2010, um, only 18 or so of the major submarine cables coming into the United Kingdom were being intercepted and uh, passed into the interception system. Some commercial companies may have held out or may not have been compromised as yet, but the system that has been adopted at the remote processing center is either to connect from the cable uh, termination points, and you can see there where Bude is in the southwest of England, so the, either with the consent of the companies, the cables are intercepted and an additional optical fiber link is taken to the processing centers at Bude or at Cheltenham, or without the consent or knowledge, secret taps are inserted in companies which aren't playing ball, which aren't playing the game, and to use the language of the industry, are backhauled into the interception centers. And there's a surprise for this parliament and this union because a new organization has joined the five eyes in providing major interception arrangements uh, and is deemed, according to the documents, to be the biggest collaborating partner of GCHQ outside the English-speaking con uh, countries. And it's Sweden, where the Fosvarets Radio Anstalt has run satellite interception facilities for many years and has also passed new internet laws to enable access to the uh, submarine cables. That is uh, one of FRA's satellite interception stations, a place called Lerkel, near Göteborg, and I apologize to Swedish speakers if I'm making a dreadful job of my pronunciation. The, pre the importance to the UQs or Five Eyes uh, organization of a Swedish participant, of course, is that they have access to cables that nobody else can get. So the global surveillance system, if not curtailed, is spreading through the EU with the participation not only of my country, the United Kingdom, but with the very active and collaborative participation of a second member state, Sweden. And the, the arrangements for cooperation seem to be extremely varied, and that is a point that perhaps might be noted by national representatives. So the secret code names are used within the system to hide the participants in the United States and the United Kingdom. And when a cable is tapped or an internet or telephony switch is made the subject of interception, it is usually given its own ultra secret code name and designated as a SIGINT activity, much like bases that you can actually see. The cross key score slide is an eye opener because it relates to a complete planet wide internet surveillance system where, as has been suggested by earlier speakers, you simply say to your analyst console, plug in the selectors, uh, that is now the technical term, replacing what we call the dictionary at the time of the echelon work, and that is uh, able to bring up all the traffic, all the thing that's been harvested for analysis. So the this is another 
um, collection center extending the global reach in the Red Sea area, and again, there's another echelon station there um, allied to it, to which the capacity has been added. The in-city type of collection, the F6, or Special Collection Service, is done from, most commonly, United States Embassy premises. And it's done rather similarly to that tower that was discovered in 1999 in the north of England with opaque panels mounted high up and containing the radio interception equipment behind it. This, um, the presence of towers like this within the United States premises in Geneva have always been very obvious and passing by, and if you look closely, you can see just how uh, a rather odd structure with opaque panels is stuck at the top of the premises. Um, I've heard it suggested, I don't know if it's correct, that in fact, uh, Edward Snowden was actually employed in this interception facility um, a few years earlier. Similar facilities are observable in Nicosia and Cyprus, and just for the sake of balance, the same is also true of the Russian Federation Embassy. Everybody's at it, everybody's at it everywhere. The United States Embassy in Brussels, which we can almost see, at least from this podium, looks innocuous enough from its frontage but take a look from above and you find superstructure added which or could almost be looking at it now and it could be listening to us. So you have in all of that a huge um, integrated capacity feeding into the collection systems and the analysis. It's put together so that where we thought we just had one major system when we looked at this in 1999 to 2001, there were now five overlapping systems that can collect um, simultaneously. Collecting on the intercepted cables upstream, collecting from satellites if it goes by that, collecting from what's called deep packet inspection inside exchanges, using the, to call it plain language term, hacking or tactical access to compromised computers and networks, also known as Computer uh, Network Exploitation, or CNE. And at the end of this story of many ways of getting at our data and our company's data and our government's data is PRIM, the system that is forced onto United States Internet service providers to create databases to be accessed by law enforcement agencies. For those who have had the time or the interest to look in depth at the diagrams that have been provided and published, say, in the Washington Post as part of Snowden's revelations, would see that, in fact, PRISM isn't even run by the NSA, but is an FBI collection effort to which the NSA, along with CIA, FBI, and others, are merely customers or clients. Not everything that we might want to know or suspect is out there seems to be in Mr. Snowden's papers or if it is, it's not out yet. Little or nothing has been published about whether satellites are impactful on our civil and commercial and communications now, although it's well established that signals intelligence satellites operating at geostationary orbit have a very, very close look at what can happen on the Earth's surface and can fill in gaps that can't be collected in other ways. It's also notable that the U.S. government has claimed somewhat strangely that well, we haven't lost all our secrets because what they call ECI, or extremely compartmented intelligence, has not been lost, or so they say. What has happened in the 12 years is that the risks and damage have been hugely exacerbated by the growth of massive collection and storage systems. Some of the ways that are clearly powerful to use and analyze and therefore bring the impact on civil society of this data haven't been well understood by people like those on the platform who are outside the intelligence community. It's perfectly clear now, as was just said, that network analysis using the meter data of who calls who and the degrees of separation between people has become a map into the existence and socialization and connection of the whole of humanity. Effects, frankly, unknown. It is breathtaking the audacity of the GCHQ mastering the Internet project to seek authority for, justification for, and simply to collect everything and to store it, um, basically, once selected, forever. 
The scale of computer hacking, deliberate intervention into networks and computers, has long since been suspected, but is new as to its scale. So the problems that then confront us on a fundamental level are also alluded to. The United States Constitution and its Bill of Rights, fantastic document, and especially the Fourth Amendment, has been carefully interpreted since the time of the Church Committee to say that human rights belong only to the citizens of the United States. And so the whole power of the apparatus that we've been talking about is untrammeled when it's directed towards us as European citizens. No, re no constraints, no limits. Marvelous, quite effective, quite serious constraints but seem to have failed in respect of those who are American citizens and who are sensible enough to communicate only in the United States. United States NGOs, along with the government organizations, have been slow to recognize the importance of universal human rights. We're all signed up to it. Well, most countries are in the, in the Charter of Human Rights, in the Declaration. Um, the United States was invited by your committee to consider um, signing the additional protocol to the Charter on Political um, Rights and did not do so. We're also seeing and have heard here how uh, information in France, there are attempts in the United Kingdom, in the United States, from these pervasive surveillance systems is being laundered into the law enforcement process. Now, for all its failures, law enforcement is a system of open checks and balances that tries to get it right according to our established norms. Its infiltration by information from selectively fed from secret, pervasive surveillance systems must be a major threat to the integrity of justice and the proper functioning of the criminal law. And the most stunning aspect of this, to my mind, is when you look back. Echelon began in 1968, in fact, was brought out of the closet in 1988 by myself and then put back in the closet until the Parliament took an interest 10, 12 years later. But at that time, computers were utterly primitive. They had valves. I don't the members what the valve was. They ran a system called the dictionary, which was quite prominent in our studies 10 years ago, but is now as utterly irrelevant as looking up a manual dictionary would be to conducting a search on Google, which we all do all of the time. But the most stunning thing of all is that the justification for the automatic collection of everything without prior suspicion or uh, prior cause is being justified by the work being done by automated or robotic processes. So a new concept seems to have come in through the march of technology that somehow or other it's safe to assign the surveillance and selection of information about our private lives to robots programmed by humans working with the much laxer controls that are imposed on meter data, communications data in place of human agents. That is new in human history and is an ideological and sociological thing that I think many of us are trying to grapple with in the months ahead, no doubt here and in the United Kingdom. My final remark about checks and balances would be this, because we're not going to, I suspect, persuade them to undo all these optical fiber taps. And there will be those cases in an imperfect society where it has helped deal with terrorism, as well as acknowledgments that it has undermined civil liberties. But if, this, if one thing has been demonstrated in the last three months, it is that checks and balances and bringing the public to knowledge of what is going on is the most important thing that can be done for democratic uh, societies. And the best thing that Europe could do, in my suggestion, would be to give sanctuary to Edward Snowden as the whistleblower who has given us so much knowledge, insight, and understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell, for this very interesting and utterly depressing 
presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I can't help thinking it's mind-boggling how if you see, you know, they, they basically know every move we make. And then there are two students who used the pressure cooker and circumvented this whole system, apparently. So it's not completely watertight. Colleagues, we have uh, 10 minutes left. We um, basically were an hour behind schedule. Um, I, I propose um, that we give the, the f well, I, I would like to invite Claude Moraes as the rapporteur to, to make some concluding remarks. And um, but maybe we can have two or three minutes uh, for very short interventions by any of the shadows if they feel the urge. No? Is that okay with you, Claude? Yes. yes? Okay, so one minute interventions by those shadows who, who feel the need. Axel Voss. Um, Only if you feel the need, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Ähm, Carlos, du hattest ja dargestellt. Carlos, you told us uh, you were talking about the uh, Echelon report. Why it hadn't led to f m more actual results? Now, I think I remember there being a lot of legal difficulties, particularly at a European level. I'm not sure that the situation is particularly different today, but uh, it would be interesting to hear what you have to say on that. Thank you. Being concise, Jan Albrecht. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, remarks. Um, and uh, I hope that all this information will also be taken notice uh, by the citizens out there, because I have the impression uh, just in this room would be uh, too less. Uh, just one question on uh, the X key score system um, to Mr. Campbell. If you uh, could note which states have access to this uh, system and uh, in uh, which context it uses uh, the Echelon program and also the Tempora and PRISM program. That wasn't very clear to me, so how they interact in this uh, system. Thank you. Okay, last uh, request for the floor by Cornelia Ernst. One minute. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much to all three. It's... Uh, not very encouraging to hear this uh, right at the end of the day, to hear about how Echelon has uh, developed up to today. I just had uh, one question. What can you pass on to us as uh, members sitting in this uh, committee? Uh, we're facing this major issue. Uh, what would you advise us in uh, a way uh, in terms of how to proceed uh, based on the experiences that you had in the committee at the time? Thank you. I'll first ask Mr. Campbell to very briefly answer the three questions and then we'll come to, uh, to Claude for concluding remarks. Um, I think I should respond just to Mr. Hablech's question on X key score. Um, X key score takes inputs from the Echelon system. Uh, that's shown on the slide. It's just called FawnSat. So if the satellites are intercepting from Internet communications, that's aggregated into the system. The X key score system is the American system, but Britain has its own system uh, related to the Tempora project. Uh, it appears to work from what we've seen on basically the same lines as might be expected. The equipment was bought from American companies, Lockheed Martin in particular. Um, and so the uh, clear message that we've had is that these are integrated databases. So uh, we know from the Guardian reporting that the NSA was using the British database. Um, Britain too has access to the X key score material through GCHQ. There is a map published of X key score sites. Um, it's rather loose. Um, you will see many countries with red dots in it. But uh, my interpretation, it is an interpretation, is that these are United States embassies uh, in the various countries uh, where the 
uh, there is a substantial analysis facility that uses X key score. Uh, so the availability of X key score outside the five, keys, five eyes countries is not documented. It may be from what is known either from the Snowden revelations or elsewhere. Uh, major countries which may have access to X key score would be India, Israel, uh, Sweden, and France. Uh, these are speculative, indicative things from documents or from revelations. Um, but uh, you can assume, I think it's totally shared within um, the Five Eyes or UK-USA alliance as we used to know it, um, and maybe partially accessible outside. NSA, I think, has been driven um, uh, much more impressively than uh, has happened in Britain to start getting public. Things have been declassified, statements have been published, and I, I believe the NSA mission statement, which was an extraordinary departure in terms of the amount they now have to say, identified them having 30 collaborating arrangements with other countries. So again, it's possible that as many as 30 countries could have some access to that data. Thank you very much. The two remaining questions on political and legal aspects are for Carlos Coelho. Thank you so much. Um, it's true some of these issues are outside of the European, of the community law. But as a parliament, we have the right to make recommendations and to play the game of blame and shame. It was what we have done in the past, and I think it's what we should partially uh, do again. Uh, when we make recommendations to the United States of America in order to subscribe international conventions, they didn't subscribe until now. When we ask the Secretary General of the United Nations, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, it's outside of our competence, but we can ask. When we are asking the institutions in order to protect our conversations, our communications, to make uh, uh, contra-spy measures, uh, to, to, to protect uh, um, the communications between the European Commission, the European Parliament, and our delegations uh, all over the world. They are rec recommendations. We, we cannot approve, but we can make the recommendations. So there are a lot of issues. We have no legal competence to approve law, but we have political competence to debate and to approve recommendations. And uh, regarding the suggesting, uh, it's, it's that suggest I, I suggest, I told that to Claude Mouraj, to revisit the 44 recommendations. Some of them are outdated. Some of, the, of, uh, some of them doesn't make sense anymore now. But biggest part are actual. Uh, we can present them again. And it's unbelievable. So many years again, a lot of recommendations approved by the European Parliament still valid. Uh, it's something we should uh, care for. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this session. I think we've had three main uh, issues today. Uh, the impact on uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, democratic oversight uh, over the, the work of intelligence services, and thirdly, lessons to be drawn from and follow up to the work of the uh, Echelon Inquiry Committee at the time. So I'm going to invite Claude Moraes, our rapporteur, to make the concluding remarks. Thank you, Sophie. Um, really, I know we're running so much over time, so I don't want to strain everyone's patience by making very long-winded uh, closing remarks, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but what I do want to do is um, uh, be cognizant of the fact that so many people are listening to us on the web stream, um, and this is the first hearing. And I noticed that I didn't take up my um, invitation to ask questions to the echelon guys and the whole system nearly collapsed when a politician didn't take up his speaking time. I noticed that, so we mustn't do that again. Um, the first thing is the procedural points. Uh, given that this is the first inquiry, I just want to say that um, uh, given the time scale for all those people who are listening and for colleagues who have come here today, uh, that this is going to be just a four-month inquiry. So compared to Echelon, which went on for a year, the CIA renditions inquiry, BSE, all of the inquiries we've had, we've got an extremely difficult task on what, as we have seen today, is the most intense of issues uh, to deal with in four months. We have a plenary vote in January of 2014, a committee vote um, in December. So we have, on the one hand, a very ambitious program for the shadows here and for uh, members, but 
while we have to be realistic, we should be ambitious in terms of the task we have as well. And I think there's a paradox here, but uh, on the first session, I think we realised that we have a very high quality of contributions, a high quality of questions, and I think it's worth saying uh, in these closing remarks that we should be, um, I think, um, I think, uh, deal with this in, a, in an ambitious way because of what we've heard today. The uh, media freedom questions, as well as the lessons to be learned from Echelon, uh, both should inspire us, I think. Um, Echelon collapsed in a way only because of the circumstances around 9-11. We heard that from Carlos Coelho today, but the quality of the inquiry showed that we can be objective um, and that we can do this across the political spectrum. So it would be wrong of me today to make conclusions both on what we heard today and indeed on the recommendations made by Echelon because that's what we have to do at the end of the process. So I won't make those conclusions. I won't make those uh, closing remarks today. What I will say is that I feel more ambitious about those four months than I did at the beginning, not so depressed as Sophie indicated just now. So to those listening in today and to everyone present here, I feel that in the next four months, while we won't have all the empirical evidence by the very nature of this inquiry, I do believe we can achieve quite a lot in the next four months if we maintain the consistency of what we had today, um, maintain the consistency of questioning and of the quality um, that we had today from the guests that we invited. Um, and also if we pay attention to what we heard just now on Echelon, that we had recommendations which were not implemented because of the external circumstances uh, that we faced. Uh, because I think that was the key point that we heard in the last few minutes. So I'll leave the concluding remarks there, uh, Chair, and um, hope that people will look at the programme. Uh, we will have between 12 to 15 inquiry meetings, the next inquiry to be held next Thursday in Strasbourg, um, and we will make that information uh, readily available to everyone. This has been web-streamed, um, and as would be fit this inquiry, uh, there will be full transparency in the way these meetings are held, um, the recommendations, minutes and so on. All of that will be uh, very open and transparent as would be expected by the, uh, the nature of the inquiry. Uh, and thank you to everyone who has uh, made this happen today. Um, and I'll hand back to you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this meeting. As uh, Claude Moraes just said, the next meeting, next inquiry meeting will be uh, on Thursday in Strasbourg. Next